The notification bell slightly distracted me from the overpowering pain I was feeling in my lower lady part, which was only getting severe for the past few days. I grabbed my phone and checked the message, hoping not to be him. And luckily, it wasn't. I didn't realize it had been so long. It was Nicholas, my childhood friend who suddenly went off to college one day and never contacted me again. He had sent me the pictures of Shadow and Willow. Damn, I had missed those two fur babies. Well, I miss my friend too, but not as much as these cats. What a surprise, I didn't expect a message from you. My reply was sent within a few minutes. I couldn't hide my excitement since he was one of my few friends I had stayed in high school. Well, if I were to look at it that way, he was the only one who stayed through kindergarten to high school. So, are you in Barcelona, for real? He was typing something, but before he could finish and send it, I texted again. He responded with yes while saying that he was here to stay this time. I told him the truth, that I hadn't visited his home after a few visits five years ago when I was not engaged and how much I missed playing with the two softballs. He said I could visit if I wanted, but that felt awkward considering I never visited them. What if his mom thinks I was there to seduce his son just like the women in Sebastian's family kept saying whenever I engaged greetings with any man? But his positive response put my mind at ease, and I agreed to the visit. Talking with him brought back all the things that I had missed ever since I got engaged, but now I was fed up with all of this. All my life, I had been in nothing but pain. My parents ignored my whimpers since the only thing on their minds was how to expand their business and how to overflow their already filled pockets. I clearly remember the age when I had been violated by none other than my uncle by blood. It was at the age of five. And I couldn't even understand what in the world was happening to me. All I could feel was the pain that was caused by his fingers. I still don't understand if I should cry over the malice that was directed at me or feel lucky that her wife entered the room and rushed toward me to save my life from his monstrous husband. By the way, she divorced him in the following month. After that, I started to avoid him whenever he visited our house, and even though I couldn't understand why my mother asked me to keep my mouth shut when I told her about this, now I know the real reason. It was because he was one of the major shareholders in their company. The day I realized that the sick man didn't only harass me, but also assaulted his daughter who constantly compared to me, was when she jumped down on my throat outside the school and roughed me up. As I was wailing on my own, hesitating to enter the school, I saw a boy staring in my direction, and then he started walking toward me. Are you okay? He stuttered those words, but for some reason, I started to bawl even louder. I was so embarrassed and scared that someone saw me in this state. If mom found out, she would scold me, so I ran away. Mom did scold me when I reached home thinking I picked a fight in school and I didn't correct her either. After doing me up a little bit, she informed me that she was going to visit one of her new friends who was also an investor in the company, so I was supposed to get along with her children. The moment I walked into that home, my eyes met with the same kid from earlier, and I backed away a bit fearing he would tell my mom about me crying. I'm Nicholas. I was surprised to see him smiling as he introduced himself to me as if he had met me for the first time. Thinking he might not remember our previous encounter, I smiled back and introduced myself. And as I was doing this, I did notice him stuttering for a few seconds before gaining composure. It felt good playing with him, till mom chatted with her friend. Finally, I had a friend of my own. The two of us started to grow closer as friends, since he also went to the same school as me. The day when our school asked if we wanted to enroll in the martial arts and self-defense class, I was the first one to raise my hand. From that day on, I started working hard on making myself stronger so that no one could ever harass me. I was in my third year of middle school when I first saw Sebastian, who was visiting with his father, who was to discuss something with my dad, and I immediately developed a one-sided crush on him. As time passed, my feelings for him remained the same and the day I first heard about my engagement talk with him, I fell over the moon. And judging by the way he was looking at me with excitement in his eyes, Sebastian felt the same about me. After the graduation, 
I overheard mom telling Nicholas's mom about my engagement date getting fixed, and since it was my first time hearing about it, I got embarrassed with all the same excitement as well. I got occupied with all the engagement shopping and preparation that I didn't realize Nicholas left for college until the day I visited his home with my mother to give him an invitation to the party. Just a month after the engagement, everything started to change. Sebastian started to get annoyed with me being friendly to any male, whether it was his father, cousin, or anyone. Annoyance evolved into a rage as he started screaming whenever any guy approached, whether it was my fault or not. The last time I went to visit Nicholas's mom and their cats, he called me asking where I was, and when I told him, he simply said he was on his way to pick me up. As I exited the house and approached him, something hard fell across my face, bruising my cheeks. My head turned to the side, and my eyes met with Nicholas's mother before tears filled in them. I didn't say anything, and silently got in the car. I don't know what Sebastian said to my mom that she somehow managed to convince Nicholas's mother to keep her mouth shut, but I didn't care, because I had already decided never to go there. That slap was nothing in comparison to what he started to do next. At first, I resisted him and used my skills on him to avoid his heinous actions, but he got my parents involved while threatening their partnership, so my parents asked me to stop fighting against him. I still remember my mom's words. Oh, I had put up with your father all your life, so why can't you? You're going to be his wife anyway, so why not start getting used to it beforehand? After putting up with it for almost six years now, I think it was finally enough, and I was not going to take it anymore. I had been almost a month now since my so-called fiancé Sebastian made his forceful attempt at lovemaking, yet again, and even though I did break his nose, I couldn't save myself from the pain that followed when he broke the wine bottle on that sensitive part between my legs. I couldn't handle the pain, and started to lose consciousness. But over the last few years of dealing with such behaviors of his, I had learned to fight that. As he was turning away from me while leaving me in such a state, I grabbed another wine bottle, limped toward him, and broke it on his head, which immediately made him lose consciousness. I took a deep sigh, all the while resisting the feeling of numbness taking over my brain and dragging myself out to his apartment, only to collapse while going down the stairs. I was taken to the emergency room by some residents of that apartment building and got immediate treatment. The wounds were not enough to cut the part too deep, but still, the bleeding wasn't stopping for about an hour or so, and when it finally did, the doctor stitched them. After getting discharged from the hospital, I locked myself in the room, refusing to see any of my parents or Sebastian. I knew if I were to say that I did not want to marry that monster, they would still keep forcing me so I decided to run away as soon as I got recovery. Even though my visible wounds were healing, the pain just doesn't go away, and the nightmares just won't stop where all these people force me to do things against my will. That was when I received Nicholas's text, and we decided to meet. I told him a few things about not wanting to marry Sebastian, but I never told him the reason, because I knew how he was even in school. When someone even just touched me, he would just throw insults at them, so much till they never even come closer to me. He was more like an overprotective brother to me. The next day when I entered his house, I realized no one was there besides him, so the two of us were alone. I also realized how much he had changed from that almost nerdy cute kid who always had the anger on the tip of his nose, to this handsome cheerful man who was giving off a bad boy vibe. We talked for a few moments, then he told me to head to his room till he was bringing a drink for us. After entering his room, I realized not many things had changed. That was when my gaze went to the novel I lost in the first year of high school. I picked it up and started going through pages, when I found a withered lily inside those pages. I remember giving this to him when we entered high school together, but I never realized he was still keeping it. That was when it hit me. Did he... like me? I turned my head to the door, only to find him staring at me with a slightly pleased smile that seemed barely visible. For some reason, 
my heart started thumping with the realization of his feelings for me. He handed the juice gently, and then he opened the beer can that he brought for himself. I was feeling so hot that I gulped the juice in a single breath, and as the last sip was finished, my head started to feel heavy. As I tried to look in the direction of the man standing in front of me, my vision started to get distorted. Since I had grown a little resistant to the drugs and the pain, I was able to fight it in my brain. I felt someone grabbing me and putting me somewhere. Then someone whispered something in my ear that I couldn't understand. But all of this was too terrifying to me, which intensified with the feeling of someone between my legs as a body pushed against mine, triggering back the pain caused by Sebastian. My uncle, Sebastian, and everyone who had mistreated me started to flash in front of my eyes, making my blood curdle. I tried harder to fight the effects of the drugs and was finally able to get through. As I opened my eyes and I looked at the man over me, I couldn't help but see Sebastian's face. All the pain, all the suffering he had caused started to resurface. I immediately grabbed him by his throat and flipped him over, my hands still strangling his neck. Before I could realize the man wasn't my fiance, it was too late. His breathing had already become too faint for him to get through this. I felt nothing as I saw his last breath leaving his body. No guilt, no sadness, or happiness of killing the man who was exploiting my body. I simply just sat there, staring at his lifeless body with a blank expression. I don't know how many hours passed when I heard someone screaming and calling 911 over me. My senses were still disoriented, and I could not feel anything at that point. A few moments later to the call, I saw someone putting cuffs over my hands and taking me with them. While walking outside the house, I saw mom and dad's car stopping in front of the house, and their timorous faces and voices were seen and heard by everyone. My lips formed a smile on their own, as they saw me and their expression change in a rather scared tiff. This smile on my lips was telling them, Now, you won't be able to force me to marry that weasel. Wanna go on a bike ride? Ryan asked out of the blue as the two of us couldn't sleep for some reason. This time at night, don't you think it's going to be a little unsafe out there? I looked at the time and it was 2 in the morning. Come on, Darlene, it would be nice feeling the breeze in our hair with peace where there won't be a single soul to disturb it. He was right, it would feel nice without anyone around. I don't know, Ryan. Still, I was a bit unsure since it's not safe at this time around. Do you want to go or not? Should I just go on my own? He looked at me and said as he got up from the bed. Fine, she shall come, I'll come, I said while getting up and running my fingers through my hair. He gave me a little smug smile as he grabbed his bike keys and the jacket. I tied my hair in a high pony and the two of us headed outside the house, locking it behind us. After taking out his bike from the garage, he handed me a helmet and started it before giving me that thumbs up to sit behind him. I was still a little anxious and nervous about this whole night riding thing, but there was a sense of excitement as well for doing something out of the ordinary. He wasn't wrong about feeling the breeze in my hair. I opened my hand to embrace the air while Ryan nagged me to put the helmet on, as it was unsafe for me to do this. This guy can sometimes be so cool while most of the time acting like an old man. His personality is so damn confusing. So I realized we had headed a bit far from home when I noticed the highway approaching, and he drove right around the circle making a U-turn. But then, as we reached an area surrounded by trees, he stopped. Why did you stop? I asked in confusion. I mean, it was two-something at night, and he was taking a break in the middle of nowhere. To do this, he turned around to grab my chin gently with three fingers and collided our lips together. A pleasant smile automatically made its way to my lips as I kissed him back with more passion, while my lips were still getting eaten by his. I noticed the street light across flickering, so I pulled away. Um, Ryan, I think we should leave. As I said that, he followed my gaze and looked up at the fluctuating light. Are you being paranoid? Scared of a little ghost? He teased me as he said that and started laughing. You know that's not the case. I'm just scared of the dark and when that light suddenly goes out, it's going to make me uncomfortable. 
I reminded him of my nyctophobia, and he agreed to get out of that place. He turned around and started the bike, and as he started moving to the street with more lights, I felt a little at ease. Just when we were approaching our neighborhood, I heard multiple bike sounds and turned around to see about four or five men riding towards us. They had tattoos and a sleeveless t-shirt with metal engraved on it. It looked like a bit street punk style and very bad at that. It seemed like guys that had no sense of style whatsoever, and as a stylist that was an extremely disturbing sight to see. Ryan increased his bike speed, making me confused, and I noticed these guys doing the same. What's going on? Are they chasing us? I asked him since it didn't seem like those guys were trying to catch on to us. They're a biker gang infamous for robbing people at night, and I think they noticed us and want trouble, he said while maintaining his impressive speed, all the while making sure I was safe. But we don't have anything for them to rob, I said in confusion since we just came out for a little night ride. We have this bike, don't we? As I mentioned that, I figured he was right. Those thugs might beat us and snatch the bike. The chase went on a bit longer, and since Ryan didn't want those people to know where we lived, he kept taking different turns, and when he was on a familiar street, I got an idea. I know a shortcut home from here. Do you think you can outrun them to make a turn at that narrow alley by the closed coffee shop? He nodded his head yes in response, which I gave him directions. And right after taking that turn, he went into the alley I mentioned before those bikers could see us. He immediately turned off the bike, and as the alley was extremely dark, we weren't visible to those guys, and they passed right through us. As I mentioned earlier, I have an extreme fear of the dark, so even though I tried to bear it to keep it under control, I couldn't help feeling panic inside and began excessively sweating. My mouth started to feel dry as I clung to the figure with me, and I could feel my heart start palpitating like a racehorse. Since the biker gang was still lurking around looking for us, we couldn't get out of the dark alley just yet, but my phobia couldn't bear being here any longer. So I passed out. I felt some water droplets being sprinkled on my face, and was woken up by that when I found myself lying on a bench with my head on Ryan's lap. He looked worried, and it seemed we were not in the dark alley anymore. The moment he noticed me opening my eyes, a few teardrops fell from his eyes to my cheek, and I immediately got up. Since I wasn't in a dark place now, my symptoms had gone down, and I was feeling a bit better, but looking at him all worked up and concerned over me gave me a bit of a nice feeling. I hugged him to reassure him that I was okay now, and after a few minutes, we decided to head back. He kept apologizing the entire way back though. He said it was because he insisted on coming outside at this time at night that I had to suffer, and I kept saying it was not his fault. We finally reached the house, and as I was entering the house, I felt a sharp gaze on my back. Turned around to see there was no one there, but still my paranoia made me get inside immediately. I locked the door behind me, and I know someone was watching us, whether it was some member of the biker gang, or someone else. Want to go on a bike ride? Ryan asked out of the blue as the two of us couldn't sleep for some reason. This time at night, don't you think it's going to be a little unsafe out there? I looked at the time and it was two in the morning. Come on, Darlene, it would be nice feeling the breeze in our hair with peace where there won't be a single soul to disturb it. He was right, it would feel nice without anyone around. I don't know, Ryan. Still, I was a bit unsure since it's not safe at this time around. Do you want to go or not? Should I just go on my own? He looked at me and said as he got up from the bed, Fine, she shall come, I'll come, I said while getting up and running my fingers through my hair. He gave me a little smug smile as he grabbed his bike keys and the jacket. I tied my hair in a high pony and the two of us headed outside the house, locking it behind us. After taking out his bike from the garage, he handed me a helmet and started it before giving me that thumbs up to sit behind him. I was still a little anxious and nervous about this whole night riding thing, but there was a sense of excitement as well for doing something out of the ordinary. He wasn't wrong about feeling the breeze in my hair. I opened my hand to embrace the air while Ryan nagged me to put the helmet on, as it was unsafe for me to do this. This guy can sometimes be so cool while most of the time acting like an old man. His personality is so damn confusing. So I realized we had headed a bit far from home when I noticed the highway approaching, and he drove right around the circle making a U-turn. But then, as we reached an area surrounded by trees, he stopped. Why did you stop? 
I asked in confusion. I mean, it was two something at night and he was taking a break in the middle of nowhere. To do this, he turned around to grab my chin gently with three fingers and collided our lips together. A pleasant smile automatically made its way to my lips as I kissed him back with more passion, while my lips were still getting eaten by his. I noticed the street light across flickering, so I pulled away. Um, Ryan, I think we should leave. As I said that, he followed my gaze and looked up at the fluctuating light. Are you being paranoid? Scared of a little ghost? He teased me as he said that and started laughing. You know that's not the case. I'm just scared of the dark, and when that light suddenly goes out, it's going to make me uncomfortable. I reminded him of my nyctophobia, and he agreed to get out of that place. He turned around and started the bike, and as he started moving to the street with more lights, I felt a little at ease. Just when we were approaching our neighborhood, I heard multiple bike sounds and turned around to see about four or five men riding towards us. They had tattoos and a sleeveless t-shirt with metal engraved on it. It looked like a bit street punk style and very bad at that. It seemed like guys that had no sense of style whatsoever, and as a stylist that was an extremely disturbing sight to see. Ryan increased his bike speed, making me confused, and I noticed these guys doing the same. What's going on? Are they chasing us? I asked him since it didn't seem like those guys were trying to catch on to us. They're a biker gang infamous for robbing people at night, and I think they noticed us and want trouble, he said while maintaining his impressive speed, all the while making sure I was safe. But we don't have anything for them to rob, I said in confusion since we just came out for a little night ride. We have this bike, don't we? As I mentioned that, I figured he was right. Those thugs might beat us and snatch the bike. The chase went on a bit longer, and since Ryan didn't want those people to know where we lived, he kept taking different turns. And when he was on a familiar street, I got an idea. I know a shortcut home from here. Do you think you can outrun them to make a turn at that narrow alley by the closed coffee shop? He nodded his head yes in response, which I gave him directions. And right after taking that turn, he went into the alley I mentioned before those bikers could see us. He immediately turned off the bike, and as the alley was extremely dark, we weren't visible to those guys, and they passed right through us. As I mentioned earlier, I have an extreme fear of the dark, so even though I tried to bear it to keep it under control, I couldn't help feeling panic inside and began excessively sweating. My mouth started to feel dry as I clung to the figure with me, and I could feel my heart start palpitating like a racehorse. Since the biker gang was still lurking around looking for us, we couldn't get out of the dark alley just yet but my phobia couldn't bear being here any longer, so I passed out. I felt some water droplets being sprinkled on my face and was woken up by that when I found myself lying on a bench with my head on Ryan's lap. He looked worried, and it seemed we were not in the dark alley anymore. The moment he noticed me opening my eyes, a few teardrops fell from his eyes to my cheek, and I immediately got up. Since I wasn't in a dark place now, my symptoms had gone down, and I was feeling a bit better, but looking at him all worked up and concerned over me gave me a bit of a nice feeling. I hugged him to reassure him that I was okay now, and after a few minutes, we decided to head back. He kept apologizing the entire way back though. He said it was because he insisted on coming outside at this time at night that I had to suffer, and I kept saying it was not his fault. We finally reached the house, and as I was entering the house, I felt a sharp gaze on my back. Turned around to see there was no one there, but still my paranoia made me get inside immediately. I locked the door behind me, and I know someone was watching us, whether it was some member of the biker gang, or someone else. I don't get what goes inside the head of those people who mindlessly murder strangers, but what I do know is that I hate such people, and that is exactly the reason why I'm preparing to become an FBI agent. I want to catch all of them who dare to snatch families away from each other just like that man did to mine that night. It was around the time when I was seven and lived with my older brother Finn and our father. I don't remember our mom though. Neither did I know who she was, since no one talked about her. 
I remembered asking father a few times, but he always gave a silent response or walked away before I could finish my question. So eventually I stopped asking him about her and continued to live in the dark. It was not like my life was bad in any way, no. Despite not having a mother to nourish and care for me, I had the best childhood one could ask for. Dad provided us with everything, whether it was his time, food, toys, or adventures. It was Finn's ninth birthday, when father told us that we would be going on a camping trip on the beach near one of the hilltops in Florida. I remember feeling exhilarated, since I always loved it whenever father took us on camping trips. Sleeping in tents and campfire stories, everything about it seemed to scream fun, so Finn and I started preparing for it right after. By preparing, I meant sneaking our toys into the bag, which were later discovered and taken out by Dad. After a long, boring three-hour drive, we finally reached the beach. Unlike other camping trips where I had seen many other campers, this one seemed empty with no one in sight. But despite being the only people on the beach, nothing felt unusual to me, so I started playing with Finn. I did notice someone sneaking around when I was in the middle of a game, and it had been a few minutes I saw that figure who seemed to be disappearing every time I turned around but thinking it might be an animal or another camper, I kind of shrugged it off and went back to playing with my brother as our father nailed the tent into the sand. A few minutes after setting up the tent and starting the campfire, I saw a man who seemed to be around in his late 20s or early 30s walking in our direction. He was carrying an extremely dirty looking bag, which made it look like he must be hiking for days. Noticing my constant glance on him, he gave me a smile that showed his crooked teeth and walked directly to my father. He asked if he could get some water as he scanned him head to toe as if he was trying to figure out something. Although I was small at the time, I still could sense there was something off about this guy. I don't know if it was some sixth sense going off or something, but I didn't like it. So I rushed to my father and hid behind him. The man's expression flickered for a second at my action, but he went back to showing his crooked smile. Father asked the man to wait for a few minutes and went inside the tent, where he had put his bags to bring out a water bottle. Finn and I followed him inside when he whispered to us, If anything goes wrong, you run to the east side of the beach and get help. I didn't understand why he said that at the time, but I figured he must be thinking the same thing as me, maybe a bit ahead of us. I remember him calling someone and whispering something that I don't remember at the time before heading out of the tent. The man waited patiently as the three of us exited the tent with a bottle of Papa's hand, which he handed to him. His smile had gone completely at this point, and he snatched the water bottle from Father's hand and gulped it in a single breath. He wiped the water from his mouth as he mumbled something under his breath before taking out a large knife from his bag. I don't remember the exact size of the thing, but it might be around 15 inches. He started coming closer to us, so Dad started shouting and warning him that he would regret doing anything. The man started to give a hysterical laugh, and even at that age, I could recognize the malice in his eyes, which was frightening. I remember that my brother and I started crying and shaking as we were utterly horrified by the situation. In front of our father, who had probably never even harmed a fly, he looked too big, so I started imagining the worse. I remember father pushing me aside as the guy lunged towards us, and before he could protect Finn, the man had gotten a hold of him. Put the boy down and deal with me, okay? He said in a slow voice, trying to reason with the madman. Shut up! Don't tell me what to do or I'll kill the kid! The man shouted, which made us cry even louder. Okay, fine, I won't say anything. Just tell me what you want. Father said in the same slow voice while putting both of his hands in the air. He turned to look at me and signaled something which I couldn't understand. I want you to come closer, the man said in a demanding voice. What? Father asked in confusion. Don't make me repeat myself, you shithead! The man shouted again while piercing the knife on Finn's neck, which made a small cut. Father panicked and walked towards him, but as he did, the man stabbed him in the chest. And the only sound that escaped his throat along with a painful groan was, Gwen, run. I screamed and ran as if I was waiting for his command, 
my snot and tears all over my face along with the hiccups that started to follow the flow of my crying sounds. I could still hear the painful screams of Finn and Father. The man was probably stabbing them, and I was going to be next after he was done with them. As I was running with my weak and small legs in the direction Father had instructed me, I bumped into someone on my way. I remembered looking up and watching two men in police uniforms who had just come out of their car after watching me run. My father, Finn, I said along with hiccups wiping my snot and tears. One of the policemen took me in the car, while the other went to where our tent was. I don't remember if they found the vicious man or not, but what I do remember is that they asked me if there was someone I could contact to inform them about my family. Later that day, when I was at the police station, Grandma came to pick me up, and her eyes were filled with tears. She embraced me in her arms while constantly saying along with her apologies and muffled cries, you poor thing. The very three words that have become triggers for my trauma. The first time I met Taylor was on a beach when I went with my parents. The area of the beach we used frequently was secluded since people didn't normally go there, and it was my mom's ideas to go there for most of our weekends. Away from the people and noises of the city, just listening to the winds and birds was nice, and I loved going there. There were a few old caves around the sea, but I never dared to go inside. You never know what kind of animal might be living there. But one day when I was walking around the beach, I strayed a little too far from my family. And that's when, just by chance, I came across another family, a couple and their son, who seemed around the same age as me. He was playing alone in the sand making castles, and when he noticed me standing, he made a confused expression, which made me feel like I wasn't supposed to be there. Just as I was about to leave with hesitation, he approached me and asked my name. I told him that my name was Robert, and I came here with my family. Upon hearing that, he smiled at me and introduced himself as Taylor. He then asked me if I wanted to play with him, to which I responded with a simple no, saying it was almost time to leave and my family would be worried if I were to be late. Judging by his appearance, one would say he had grown up in the woods, but despite that, he seemed like a nice kid, and looking at how he was playing alone in the sand, I would say he was lonely. I went back to where my parents were, and since it was almost sundown, we got in the car and headed back home. A few days went by, and as spring break was approaching, we didn't get the time to go to the beach anymore, so we decided to visit during the break. Mom and Dad got busy with their non-ending work, and me and my sister with our school and friends. A day after spring break was to start, I met up with my friends in a gaming cafe, and we discussed what we were going to do for spring break. Just when I was leaving after saying goodbye to the boys, I saw Justin. He was walking across the street, hand in hand with his mother, and judging by his pale face and his constant coughing, he looked pretty sick. There was a flu spreading around that time, so I figured he might be under the influence of that flu or something. I did think of approaching him to ask if he was doing okay, but then I hesitated. I didn't know if he was contagious, and since I didn't want to get sick right before spring break, I went on my way. On the third day of our break, Emily and I insisted our parents take us to the beach since we had been eagerly talking about doing a treasure hunt and couldn't wait any longer. It was decided that we would go to the beach the next day, so we started prepping for the treasure hunt. There was an old metal detector lying in the garage, so we sneaked it into the Jeep, knowing too well that Dad would not be happy about it if he were here to find out about it. After one last quick scan to see if we hit it well, we went back to our room. Luckily, he didn't notice it when loading our other stuff in the next morning, and it came as a huge relief for us. We all went inside to take our seats, and he began a two plus hour drive. He finally pulled into the area of the beach, which was by this time way too familiar to us. My sister and I rushed out, started jumping and playing around the beach. After everyone settled to have fun, Emily took out the metal detector, and we went to the other side of the beach to start our treasure hunt. It was the same area that was surrounded by the old caves, so I was feeling a bit scared. But looking at how bravely my sister was moving forward, I decided to put on a straight face as well. We were in the middle of the hunt, when I stumbled across Justin. 
he didn't look sick anymore. So I asked him about it while telling him that I saw him the other day across the street. He said they were coming back from the hospital because he had a fever for a few days, but it went down last night, so he was fine now. After that, he asked if he could participate in the treasure hunt with us, to which we agreed. And since we had three people now, we decided to play a little game. Whoever was to find the most treasure within an hour when we would meet back here, the same spot we were standing at that moment, would be declared the winner. And since Emily was the youngest and weakest, we let her use the metal detector that she insisted on using. It didn't matter either way, looking at how that old thing was only going to drag us down. So the game began, and we all went in different directions. I got too preoccupied in the game and finding treasure, I didn't even notice that I walked inside of a cave until the darkness hit. And as I was about to turn around, I saw Justin walking inside. Dude, what are you doing here? I asked as he approached me. I'm looking around the caves for treasure. Look how many of them I found. He took out a few old looking jewelry and stones from his pocket and showed them to me. Fine, you go ahead and look. I'm not going in there. Who knows if there's a bear or tiger inside ready to jump on us. I walked back after saying that. Although these animals were not known to live in the area looking at how people come to enjoy this place, and some might even come here for camping, the idea of being eaten by a wild animal was not my ideal death. Okay, don't be silly, there's nothing inside, trust me. Let's just go look in there and look together. He grabbed my hand and forced me inside, and just when the rocks on the entry collapsed blocking it completely. As we got stuck inside with no way out, I started screaming for help and calling out my sister's name as she might be the closest one. But even after an hour or two of screaming, no one came to rescue us. I started breathing heavily with this immense amount of panic suddenly rushing into my mind. As I'd mentioned earlier, I may have masked a brave face in front of my sister, but the fact was that I was constantly easily scared of little things than her. As I was filled with fear in the darkness of the cave with a silent Justin behind my back, I tried a feeble attempt to pull away a few rocks from the blocked entrance, but it was no use. I couldn't even see my own hands in this pitch dark cave, let alone the difference between small and big rocks. So I palpitated this ground with my hands to find an area to sit. Nothing out of the ordinary happened after that, except for the fact that the two of us were stuck inside a dark cave without a plenty amount of water and food. I did have two bottles in my backpack, along with a few packets of chips, but I didn't want to share them with Justin. I wasn't sure how long we would be stuck there. The strange thing among all of this that I haven't heard him speak ever since the boulders collapsed on the entrance. I couldn't even tell where he was. But just as I couldn't see him, I was sure he couldn't either. I did try a few times calling out to him though, but there was no response from his side. I don't know how many hours or days passed, but I started to feel dizzy from starvation now. One of those water bottles was already empty, looking at how I kept sneaking a few sips without making any sound. There was still nothing from Justin, except for a few groaning sounds once in a while coming from a distance. I couldn't remember by now where he was standing when we first got stuck, nor did I care. The only thing that came to mind was of a hunger and how to survive this adversity. More time passed. I don't know, a month or more. My chips packet was empty now. The only remaining water bottle was more than half empty. I had started to take sips only when the thirst was unquenchable and the lack of food was making me lose strength in my body. Even moving would require energy, so I wasn't doing that either. The fact that I was still alive was more like a miracle to me, but hallucinations had already started a few days ago, and my memories started to get foggy. The last thing I remember was someone attacking me, possibly Justin. He did try to bite me on my neck in other places, but I didn't hear anything besides a grunting sound. I'm sure it wasn't an animal, because when I grabbed him I could tell it was human, but I don't remember much after that since I don't have any recollection after that. As time passed, my body started to decline, and just when I gave up thinking I won't be able to survive any longer, a sudden blinding light hit my eyes. I brought myself to look in the direction and saw a few men clearing the rocks and entering the cave. Mine and Justin's parents were behind them, and the moment they saw me, they ran crying towards me, while Justin's parents desperately looked around to see their son, who was nowhere to be seen. 
After searching for him throughout the cave, they found a few animals and human skulls and bones. But Justin wasn't there. I don't remember him ever speaking during that time frame, so I figured he must have escaped somehow before the entrance got blocked. I was taken to the emergency room and was admitted there for a few days. But after I got discharged from the hospital, my health started to decline at a rapid rate. and I started to have a fever along with a bone pain and threw up often. I didn't have an appetite any longer and wasn't able to digest even the little amount I consumed. I had lost more than half of my original weight and was still losing. When my condition didn't get better and I started coughing up blood, the doctors ran a few tests only to diagnose that I had stage 3 multiple myeloma and it was getting worse day by day. My treatment began with no hope that I'd be able to survive through it or not. I was having flashes these days, I guess it's the fragment of memories that I lost in that cave, in which my teeth are ripping some raw flesh and eating it. But I can't seem to remember what animal it was because I knew for a fact that there wasn't any inside the cave. The pale sick face of Justin I saw that day across the street was starting to resemble mine. Well, mine is getting worse day by day. I don't want to believe the lost memories are what I think they are, so I'm trying my best to avoid remembering them. And even though what I did might have been a survival instinct, I'm no better than a monster if I did. Then again, I guess that must be why I'm getting my deserved punishment. There are pretty disturbing posts and stories you come across while going through 4chan that is too much to handle for those who are weak hearted. But those of you who don't know about this, 4chan is an anonymous website where one can post anything without any filter. This was back in 2011, around the time when I first got to know about the website. I was still in high school and a pretty naive kid who used to follow what other most popular kids used to do. The reason was that I was always in a world of my own, watching movies like a high school nerd suddenly getting popular and started hanging out with the cool kids, eventually ending up with the most gorgeous girl in the entire movie. What I didn't know at the time was that sometimes real life can be scarier than a movie. Looking at how kids in my school were always on their phones, doing nothing, I started doing the same. It was the time when I started going through 4chan just to keep myself busy. But as time passed, I somehow started to become addicted to the website, since it always had something new and interesting. I never actually posted anything or talked with anyone. I was more of an observer or whatever entrancing things were going on the forum. As I was more and more absorbed in it, I started losing interest in the popular kids and focused more on what was keeping me constantly interested. One day when I was going through the website, I saw someone post a picture of a red painted chair with a star sign over it. I don't know why, but for some reason the necklace seemed strangely familiar, which was weird. The chain seemed freshly painted since it was still wet and was smudged all over the table it was put on. Upon looking at the picture, anyone could say that the person who had uploaded the picture is trying to boast his or her painting skills, which was pretty sloppy. It didn't seem like something to look at, so I shrugged it off, and since the class was about to start soon, I put my phone in my locker after turning it off. In the middle of the lecture, I noticed the fifth seat of the second row was empty. It looked like Annie was absent. She was the most beautiful girl in the entire school, and obviously the girl I had a crush on, since she was going to become mine someday. I was pretty disappointed that she was absent as sneaking glances during the lectures had become my favorite hobby. She was always accompanied by her best friend Elizabeth, who was the second most beautiful girl probably playing the role of the second female lead in our story. The girl who always fell in love with the main lead, but due to my heart belonging to Annie, she would have to be disappointed in the end. The lecture ended when I was lost in my imagination. And since I wasn't able to pay attention to it, I was going to have to go to the library to give an extra hour to cover up the lesson. The remaining lectures went by just as normally as they always have been, and once I was done with the class, I went straight to the library. Looking at the number of students in our school, it was quite big. It didn't lack any facilities either. It had a cafeteria that served good food, multiple playgrounds, and music rooms. But what I loved the most were the two libraries. Most of the students used to go to the big library in the main building, 
while the second library, which was smaller in comparison, and being in the East Building was not so popular, despite being peaceful. It was because the East Building was a bit far, and only a few classes used to be held there in rare cases. Rumors among students said that there were ghosts in that building, but they were all false since I always used to go to that library and study till late. Since the library was on the third floor and the elevator not working as usual, I started walking up the stairs, when I heard faint whispers coming from the last classroom in the left corridor. I was instantly reminded of the ghost rumors, but I shook it off because I knew very well that there was no such thing as ghosts. The door of the room was partially open, so peeked through and saw two of our students standing there. I could only see their backs, so I couldn't figure out who they were. As my eyes scanned the area, they landed on Annie's lifeless body. I couldn't stop the sudden scream from leaving my throat, causing the two students to turn immediately. For some reason, my legs gave up. I knew in my mind that I had to run and tell someone, but the cowardliness in my cells was at its peak. My body froze, my eyes stuck on Annie's slit throat. I was too petrified to be able to do anything. I somehow broke free of it, only to find that Elizabeth and Andrew weren't there anymore. They killed Annie. I had to do something, I had to tell the principal about it. And as I was turning about thinking this, I saw Andrew standing behind me with an unsettling smile forming across his lips. I was thrown around in one blow, causing my back to hit the wall and making a cracking sound along the way. He then took out his belt and started striking me, aiming mainly at my neck area. I started crawling away from him. He grabbed my left foot and started dragging me inside the classroom Annie was in. These bastards knew very well that no matter how much I scream, it was almost impossible for my voice to reach someone, and even if they did hear a faint sound coming from there, they would probably assume it was a ghost. He broke my arms and my left ankle, causing me an immense amount of pain. Before I could let out a scream, he stood on my throat and started strangling me with his foot. As I was passing out from the lack of oxygen and pain, I could see a silver star chain necklace peeking out from his shirt. Ah, I remember now. It was Annie who used to wear it. No wonder it looked familiar. These were the last thoughts that came across my mind before everything went dark. When I woke up, it was already dark. I painfully managed to turn my face around only to find Annie's body missing. Guess they might have taken it. They must have thought I was dead, that's why they left me here. Hiding two dead bodies on the same day must have been too much for them, so they cleared the one that had the possibility of rotting. Everything was broken in my body, so getting up was extremely painful. I don't know how I managed to gather so much courage, but I still managed to do it, and dragging myself out of the school to the hospital that was a few blocks away from there. Watching me walk into the hospital building in such a condition, the nurse preset there rushes to my side and took me to the emergency room. When the doctor asked me who did it, I opened my mouth to tell him. I realized I was unable to speak, since that monster stood on my throat and strangled me with full force. Don't worry, it'll take some time, but it will heal. Take some rest till now. I watched his back as he walked away after saying that. A clump of tears formed in my throat with the helplessness I was feeling. With every single hit he had given me, it was like I was forcibly shaken away from my dream to my senses. Reality is truly scarier than a movie. Popeye's chicken? No, I'll pass. I held a hand to my mouth as I replied. The reason was an unpleasant memory of the past that had just rushed to the surface upon the mention of the restaurant's name. Why are you making such an expression? Leia threw the same question at me about what anyone asked in that situation. Trust me, you don't want to know. I said while trying not to think of that flashback that was making me nauseous. Try me. If there's something that's making you not want to go non-veg, I'd want to know. Her lips formed a smug smirk as she said that. Well, it was surely going to be wiped off after hearing my story. Well, I didn't want to remember it, but if you want to know, be my guest. I shrugged my shoulders while saying that. After that, I began to tell her about the day, which started as one of the less nice days. Like most working people, my weekends are often shitty, and since I couldn't even complain about it, I would just go stuff my face during each lunch break. 
That was a different matter, and even after my constant food consumption, I would still look like skin and bones to others, and then they would suggest I eat a little more. This part would always be funny to me. Only Leia was the person who knew just how much I was capable of eating in a single day. That day was as rotten as any other, since it went off with my team leader making an uncomfortable joke about how wafer-thin my legs were. I swear to God, if it wasn't for my job, I would have knocked that nasty piece of work's teeth out. But all I did was gulp my coffee and get back to work, with all the fueling rage locked inside. I thought, maybe if I ignore that annoying shit, my day would just go on without any trouble. But it was wishful thinking on my part to assume that. That ogre in the team leader's skin came again to irritate me by giving me the work which he was supposed to do, while again throwing words on my sliminess. I gritted my teeth and cussed him numerous times inside my head, but I still did whatever work I was given. Guess that was the main reason people thought of me as a pushover since I would always do everything despite making faces over it and swearing at them in my thoughts. After I was done with his work, I went back to finish mine and as a result, I had to work over the hours once again. By the time I completed everything, it was already 9pm and my mood was foul, so I decided to fill my belly to lift the dark clouds over my head. There was a Popeyes outlet near my company, which I hadn't tried yet, and as I was exiting, I turned toward it thinking I wouldn't leave the restaurant without burping all the anger out of me. While walking, I noticed the area was unusually quiet with almost no one in the area. Even the parking lot of the outlet had not a single vehicle around. Looking at the time, it wasn't that late for people to hang around at a food place, so it was hard for me to get my head around why it was the opposite. The moment I walked inside, I somehow got the idea of the actual reason behind the bare minimum sociality in the area. The carpet that was placed on the inside door was black, but just by looking at it, I could tell that the color was supposed to be different. There weren't many staffs around, just a cashier on the counter, and by the looks of it, there was only one server girl, and possibly a cook in the kitchen. They were so focused on their phones that they didn't even notice me walking in. Trust me, I was thinking of turning back, but the guy noticed me and said a welcome with his lips forming into a wide smile. I couldn't turn back now, so I walked over to him and ordered medium fried chicken wings and a large coke. After paying for the items, I went to take one of the empty seats and started to scan the restaurant. There were webs in the upper corner of the walls, along with a few spot marks on them. The floor looked like it hadn't been cleaned in days. The only clean things among everything seemed to be chairs and tables. I wondered if anyone ever came into this outlet, and judging by the condition, how come it wasn't closed yet? This outlet was not taking care of hygiene properly, and I was guessing the condition of the kitchen might have been similar. Even after waiting for half an hour, when no one came out with my order, I got up and asked at the counter how much longer was it going to take, and after saying five minutes more, the guy went back to focus on his phone. No wonder this place was empty. My day had already been one heck of a disaster, and I didn't want it to get any worse, so I decided to take out my phone and silently record everything. As the cashier was already on their phone and the server girl had gone into the kitchen, I decided to sneak there and check what in the world was going on. And as I did, I was horrified by what I saw. Rats and cockroaches were crawling around like it was their home and dirty utensils were lying around in the kitchen slab. The server girl was standing in the corner talking over her phone while a man was preparing my order, and in amidst watching a video, every corner of the kitchen seemed greasy and dirty. The condition was far worse than the rest of the restaurant. The man took out something, and as he was grinding some sort of spices, I saw some cockroaches getting in and the person was so busy on their phone, he didn't even notice what got into the blender. I almost threw up with this level of carelessness and unhygienic condition. Staying there any longer was not an option for me anymore. As I turned around and strode out the door, it grabbed the cashier's attention. He kept calling for me saying my order was almost done, but there was no way I would eat that any longer. I did puke right after exiting the restaurant, and I called the health department to file a report over this, sending them the video I had shot. 
Walking back to my apartment, I couldn't get those nasty scenes out of my mind that I had seen there. After that day, I could never eat Popeye's chicken ever again, nor am I able to eat takeout without knowing the condition of the restaurant. Hell, even I don't want to eat from them anymore, and hearing what you just told me, I think I don't feel so good. Leia held a hand over his stomach and said with a pale, nauseated face, It was one of those beautiful days when you feel unreasonably happy, and no matter how many times someone tries to piss you off, you just smile at them and try to act positive, because everything around you seems nice. My buddy Sam had returned from his grandparents' house after three whole months, and the two of us were about to go for a night drive as we had been doing for the past two years. Looking at how wildly excited I was, I didn't let Matt's vexation annoy me doesn't matter how much of a pain in the neck he was. Matt and Sam was my dorm mates, and while Sam was my best friend, Matt on the other hand got on my nerves by always sticking his nose in our business and throwing tantrums at us every chance he got. I don't know what it was, but I was sure that there was something wrong with his brain since he used to pull some sick pranks on us. Well, it was mostly on Sam, but still, they were abhorrent. One time when he put a real poisonous snake under his quilt, luckily I saw its tail before Sam could sit on the bed. Otherwise, it would have bitten him, and who knows, he could have died from the poison. It seemed all too funny for Matt putting others in dangerous situations to a fault that I secretly hated him. Anyway, as I was telling you about my gratuitous happiness over the night driving, I started preparing it, and I remember clearly that I did pack two drive lights. The second one was for a backup, just in case the primary one got any faults. On the night arrived, the two of us headed to the sea, and after putting on our diving suits, we submerged into the sea. For those of you who have never dived underwater, Trust me, the weird happy feeling of being weightless and free to explore the underwater world while always ending up discovering new things, it's absolutely astonishing. As we were exploring, Sam's dive night suddenly started fluctuating. I turned toward him to see him telling me through sign language that he needed the backup light since he didn't bring one. So we went to the surface to bring the light from our truck, and while Sam stayed in the water, I went to pick up the dive light. But to my surprise, my bag was missing, and I was trying to look through the truck to find it. I heard Sam's blood-curling scream. I turned around to see he wasn't there. I flashed the light to see if he was around there somewhere, but there was no sign of him. Thinking it must be a prank, I started calling out his name, but no response. I thought he might have been underwater and hiding from me. Sam, where are you? This isn't funny, man. I'm counting to ten, and leave if you still don't come out. I started counting slowly after saying that, but even after the last digit ended, he didn't appear. I dived back and I started looking for him, and still I couldn't find him anywhere. My heart started thumping loud frantically with worry, as he had seen no one else at the dock besides ourselves. When he still didn't come out even after an hour went by, worry turned into fear of terror. I had no idea what might have happened to him. As I sat there on the dock looking at the sea, hoping for him to come out, I saw part of the water turning bright red. It was as if my breath got stuck in my throat, and as I looked at it terror-stricken, Sam's body surfaced on the water floating. A scream escaped my throat and echoed in the area of the nightmarish scene. I couldn't stand it any longer and started running, but that was when I remembered I had to report this. I dialed 911 with shaking hands and informed them about the situation as I ran to the dorm. When I reached my room, I found my bag on the bed, which was strange because I clearly remembered putting it in the truck. Matt's sickly face suddenly flashed in my mind. Yes, he was capable of doing something of this sort. I looked around, and he was nowhere to be found for some reason. It was getting frightening. The possibility of living in the same space as someone capable of murder was dismaying. Why did you do it? I leaped on him as soon as I saw him walking through the door. Even if he was a killer, I was sure he wouldn't do anything inside the dorm, looking at how there were so many people living there. What are you talking about? Get off me! He said as he threw me off. Strangely looking at him didn't seem like he was toward the dock, but one could never say what a psychotic mind could plan. I know it was you who killed Sam. He looked at me with a shocked expression, as if he really had no idea that Sam had died. 
It almost seemed as if he wasn't the one who killed him. Sam is dead? He muttered under his breath. I was confused, because even though it did look like he was shocked by the news, he didn't seem sad. Instead, he looked happy. I started to have an upsetting feeling in my stomach, and my feet started to retreat on their own as he looked at me with a devilish grin on his face. It's still sad that I wasn't the one to do it. As he said that, my hands began trembling, which I hid behind my back. But he didn't do anything, and just exited the room. I guessed that he went to the crime scene to look at Sam's dead body. As he vanished after my eyes, my legs came out as if they had been waiting for him to leave, and I fell to the floor, tears streaming down my cheeks as I continued looking in the direction of the door. The killer was never found, and no one has any idea what happened to Sam that night since the police weren't able to find anything either. I moved dorms to avoid any possible encounter with Matt. He hasn't made any movement to harm me as well, and nor did anyone else try to kill me, but still, I'm scared to go on dives now. The scene of the water turning crimson red and Sam's body surfacing still haunts me to this very day. Most of us have experienced sleep paralysis, and it might be different for everyone. For someone like me, who used to have sleep paralysis a few times a week throughout my teen years, it was always accompanied by a loud ringing in my ear and a looming sense of dread. I didn't have anyone to explain to me properly at the time that this was something other than being possessed, so I used to think that I had an evil spirit inside of me who used to do these things to me. As for the word sleep paralysis, I had never heard it until a few years later since no one in my home believed me, and neither did I ever hear any teachers telling us about anything similar. And being a nerd in my school and having a lack of friends, I never heard anyone else talking about this either. The first sleep paralysis that I experienced was when I was six years old. It didn't happen after that for a few years, until I was in my sophomore year of high school. This time, when I was suffering through it, it felt as if something was holding me sitting on my chest and screaming in my ear. My eyes were open. I could feel myself beginning to suffocate. My body was numb, and I was entirely unable to move. The heavy feeling in my chest made me feel that I was going through was not normal one bit, and there might be demonic powers in action. I tried to scream for someone, but couldn't get the words out, breaking out of that horrifying experience. I was so panicked in the situation that I could not understand what to do or how to get rid of that suffocation. The moment I gave up, I was awake, and I was as terrified and traumatized as the first time I experienced it. I ran to my parents' room, waking them up. I told them that I was getting haunted by something that made me stuck in my sleep, but they were too careless and irresponsible about it that they dismissed me, saying I might just be having a nightmare disappointed with the fact that my parents didn't believe me. I went back to my room, started crying. My father was very strict. He was the kind who loved me as well as abused me. The kind of abuse who would be punching you, slapping you, scolding you when you were in the wrong. So it was extremely rare that he ever took me seriously. Mother was just the same, except she only used to scold and punish me verbally. Well. It was just me because at my age that I thought of it as abuse, but despite all that strictness, I knew they loved me in their own way. Anyway, so the sleep paralysis kind of continued every week after that, and even though it was as terrifying as ever, I started to get a bit used to it. But the worst part was that my sleep schedule started to get disrupted, and as the sleep paralysis increased, so did my fear of sleep. There were some times when it got to the point that I would start hallucinating and whenever I broke out of that state, I would feel so tired and sweaty as if I had done a heavy workout. There had even been times when I experienced false awakenings thinking that I did not have an episode that day, but later found out upon waking up in paralysis that it was a dream within a dream. Everything that I was enduring was getting worse. My eyes started to get dark and baggy and my energy was drained out for the rest of the day. Even in school, I was unable to focus during class and my grades started to fall rapidly. 
My father's scolding increased and so did my stress level. I slowly started to get depressed. But that was even more depressing was no one around me even noticed my rapid health fall until one day when my grandmother came for a visit. Don't you eat anything, my dear Putin? Look how small your face has gotten, she said while cupping my cheeks with her wrinkly hands as she looked at me with her weak, shiny smile. I do, Nana, but look at you. You don't seem to age any longer. Some might confuse you and mom for sister. I complimented her jokingly, which made her laugh a bright smile. After chit-chatting for about an hour with Nana, I went back to my room and sat at my study desk since my grades were dropping. I had to catch up on a lot of small material if I wanted to avoid more scolding. Within a few minutes after opening the books, my head started throbbing as I was a half-sleep state because last night I didn't get a proper sleep as usual. It's getting harder for me to keep my eyes open. So I laid my head on my desk and I gradually fell into sleep. As I was in sleep mode, I started to hear a ringtone which wasn't mine. It seemed like it was part of some dream and my brain kept signaling me to pick up the phone. But as I tried to pick it up, my body didn't give any response and I was unable to move. This familiar feeling as if my body got frozen from head to toe was not new. But this time, the suffocation and the terror were greater than I had ever experienced. Even though my eyes were closed, I could see the blurred vision of my desk where my head was laid. That was when I heard footsteps, and when someone started calling my name. The voice was so faint that it seemed like it was coming from a distance. It felt like Grandma was standing beside me, but I couldn't call out for her as my voice wasn't coming out. Instead, I could feel my lips moving. Grandma started shaking me violently, and I could tell that her expressions were somewhat worried. For a strange reason, that made me relaxed. Her worrying about me felt relieving because I had never seen such expressions before even from my parents who gave birth to me. I started making more efforts to move and then all of a sudden, a current ran down my body giving me a feeling that like my soul was returning and I was able to move. Then I took a long sigh of relief and tears started flowing down my eyes. Grandma immediately embraced me in her arms and started consoling me. She gave a good scolding to my parents later that evening while informing them about my condition. And then the next day they took me to the sleep doctor who first diagnosed my condition and then told me to practice a few sleeping techniques to prevent that. Thanks to that I'm better now. And the sleep paralysis only happens a few times a year. Only if they believed me before that I wouldn't have to go through such terrifying suffering. It's been eight years since that horrifying incident took place, but I still feel like it was just yesterday when I boarded that ship with my parents. Though I wish we hadn't, maybe things might have been different now. Only if I had stopped it somehow, or only if we hadn't gotten an invitation. No, only if they didn't arrange that party on a cruise in the first place, then none of this would have happened. I was 13 at the time when my mom informed me while handing me a suit to wear that we would be going to a party. I never liked parties as a kid. Socializing's not my thing, even at my current age, so I asked her if I could skip it. But the moment she mentioned the sea, I was ready, because I was always a huge fan of water bodies. I used to dream of becoming a diver back then. My favorite animal was a seahorse, and favorite superhero was the Aquaman. Hell, I was taking private swimming lessons, which I got by insisting for months, so imagine the confidence boost I must have gotten when I heard that so there was no way I was going to pass on such a golden opportunity. Once I got ready, I was called downstairs, where my other family members were gathered. But as I went down, the only people I saw were my mom and dad. I thought maybe others were still getting ready, that's why I couldn't see them. But when we started to head out without them, I couldn't help it. How come it's only me? Where are George and Freya? I asked about my siblings, who were nowhere to be seen. George is working on a college assignment, and Freya's having a tummy ache, Mama said, stopping on her track and looking at me. You know they are making up excuses, right? I looked at her as if she was some kind of fool to believe in their tricks. Yeah, I know, but I didn't force you to come either, did I? You can still stay if you want to, 
she said with a knowing smile on her face. No, I want to come. I rushed out of the house after saying that, and the two of them started laughing. We drove for about an hour till we reached the coast where the ship was already waiting for us, and by the looks of it, we were the last guests to arrive there. Upon entering the ship, I could see hundreds of people abroad, looking at how only adults were out there dancing, eating, and everything without any other child in sight made me start to wonder why in the world did I agree to come. The music was so loud and it was piercing my eardrums, and the way those women were dancing made me uncomfortable just by looking at them. I turned my head to see my parents' reaction, and they seemed surprised judging by their sophisticated attires. I guess they were expecting a different kind of party. They gave me an apologetic look, which I acknowledged right away, and after informing them that I would be someplace quieter, I went to the side of the ship where no one was around. As I was standing over the edge, watching the waves with music come from the other part of the ship where people were drinking and dancing, etc., I saw a woman approaching the area while talking to someone over the call. As it was already nighttime, the cruise's lights were on, but at that particular time, I swear I saw those lights fluctuating, but they returned to normal after a few seconds. I turned around to see the woman gone, thinking she might have gone back to the party. I turned my head to look at the sea waves again, but as my eyes caught sight of a part of water slowly turning red as ship passed by it, my face turned pale. There was no one in the water though, so it was hard to tell if the red part was human blood or something else, at least I was hoping it not to be. I was freaked out to the point where I wanted to run to my parents and ask them to return, but I knew that was not a possibility as we were already in the middle of the sea so I stayed there. A few moments passed. A couple came in hoping to escape the watchful eyes of the people while making out. For some reason they couldn't see me, possibly because I was being quiet like a mouse. Anyway, this time I saw it. I saw at the surrounding light fluctuation and a wave swallowed their bodies unobtrusively without leaving a single trace of droplet behind. It frightened the hell out of me. Not just the mysterious entity kidnapping two grown humans from the boat, but looking at how mystifying it was as I saw the water turning red again without their bodies being visible. I was sure that they have gone the way of all flesh by now, and as someone who has been standing on the edge for hours now, my death was supposed to be forthcoming before these people. But for some inexplicable reason, the wave hadn't done anything to me. As my heart started palpitating with fear, I caught sight of another section of water turning crimson red, but this time, it didn't look as if it took only one or two people. I noticed the music slowly abandoning the noises of people and becoming perspicuous and making my heart trickle along with it. Running toward the area where my parents were, I screamed in fear and trepidation, not knowing if they were spared or not. I saw my mom standing near the pool completely frozen with a devastating look on her face. The moment her eyes met mine, a single drop of tear fell out of her left eye down to her cheek right before the wave snatched her in the blink of an eye. A holler of cry left my throat as I ran in a failed attempt to help, and by the time I went there, I saw the sea turning red yet again. I was left alone on the ship that was surrounded by the sea filled with blood. I don't remember much after that, except the tremendous amount of fear I felt, not knowing when and who saved me from the boat, and how did I reach home? Yes, I do have a vague memory of cops asking me a few questions, but I couldn't get what they were asking. The memories of my siblings' roaring cry are clear though, but not much after that. I was in a state of trauma for months to the point where I did not even speak a word except screams of agony that I had through all those nightmares. I developed aquaphobia after that and never went near the water apart from my shower. The last smiling face of my mother as we left the house kept on entwining with the memory before her death, still causing me to experience a great deal of anguish. That day, I was working on research about an important topic and I needed to conduct field work to collect some specimens underwater. 
I also needed to gather data on a strange looking fossil we found underwater a few days ago. Furthermore, I wanted to check if there were more evidence connected to it. There was a huge possibility that it could be a new species if I could only find proof, so diving under the sea was imperative. My team included five other marine biologists other than me, so it would be okay to leave the observation of other organisms to study their behaviors and interactions. If you're thinking we only focus on one project at a time and leave all the others while doing it, then you're wrong. There might be some who may prefer focusing on only one task at a time, but not all of us. So while I handled one of the topics that I was sure would be able to maneuver on my own, still, I asked Christian to come with me in case I needed some backup. Looking at how the lab wasn't far from the sea, it didn't take much time for us to drive there. Once we were there, we switched into our diving gear, and after checking that everything was in order, we plunged into the water and started moving forward. Even though I was leading this research, Christian had a pretty good insight about it, and that was the very reason why I chose him to be there with me. Well, there was another reason behind that. I had a teeny tiny crush on him and was hoping for things to escalate a bit further than work. Since I'm a big workaholic, I didn't when things started to get darker. I hint that the day has fallen and the duskiness of the night started to replace it, but I was too busy collecting the specimen that I didn't even care, and as I was scanning the area of my eyes went to an exceptionally old looking ship. By the looks of it, it was untouched which was weird looking at how our divers come here so often and still hadn't reported sightings of it. To put my curious mind at ease, I went ahead to traverse the ship and started exploring. Before I was about to dive deeper, I informed Christian that I would be exploring further for a bit longer and that if he wanted to take off with the samples, he could since it was getting late. I know most of you might know this, but for those who don't, we use hand signals while diving. For marine biologists like me and Christian who are experts in diving and looking at how we need to be underwater almost every week, we have learned complete sign language and can easily commune with each other. Anyway, so as I was looking around the broken old ship, I could sense a strange aura around it. Trust me, I've seen a few things underwater, but nothing had given off such an ominous vibe. I looked around the outer area at first, nothing much to see there so I moved toward the engine room. and that moment, I opened two human skeletons were found there, which still give me jump scares even after seeing so many of them. I mean, come on, who wouldn't freak out from two human skeletons found in an underwater ship at night? I didn't want to go further inside as the ship was already giving me a hair-raising feeling, but as I was about to leave, I noticed a room that seemed to be locked from the outside. My curiosity got the best of me yet again, so I went there, and the moment I put my left hand on the palm, it fell. Out of curiosity, I walked inside, only to see the most disturbing, nightmarish scene. At least a hundred skeletons were inside, all of them wearing clothes that had almost melted away at this point. It looked like someone had locked all these people inside on purpose and left them to die. My heart started to beat uncontrollably, and I couldn't watch the macabre scene any longer. The eerie feeling that had surrounded the ship only grew stronger by the minute. I immediately went out of the room and started to swim upwards to get away from the horror, but as I was to exit the perimeter of the ship, a mysterious yet terrifying force stopped me from getting out. For some reason, no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get out of there. It was as if there was an invisible wall surrounding the ship. I could see Christian waiting for me at a distance, looking worried, but he wasn't looking in my direction. So I tried to use my transceiver to try and tell him that I was stuck there, but for some reason, probably something to do with the ghostly ship, it wasn't working. I tried swimming around it in an attempt to find a way to escape it, but it was no use. Whatever was blocking me had surrounded the ship from everywhere. As I continued with my struggle to get out of there and kept failing, my optimism started to fade. And just when I was about to lose all my hope, a weird hankering took over my mind and I started to swing against the barrier. Finally, I was able to get through. And as I did, Christian's eyes met mine and I could feel him taking a sigh of relief. He asked me through the hand signs where I was for this long and I turned around to point toward the ship. It wasn't there. Mistaking my freeze for me not wanting to tell him, 
Christian grabbed my hand and started to swim toward the surface. But as we were proceeding, we felt a down current coming from the same direction where the ship was. It was almost as if whatever it was didn't want us to leave alive. Thank God that we weren't caught in it, because even though we knew techniques to get out of currents, I wasn't sure if we could escape from this one. Once we got out of the water, Christian turned to me and asked where I disappeared to in the middle of the dive. What do you mean where? Didn't you see me go to that ship with your own eyes? I asked, raising an eyebrow, even though I had a hunch about the reality. I just wanted to confirm it through him. A ship? There was no ship there. All I saw was you diving deeper before you disappeared and then reappeared after about an hour. Do you have any idea how worried I was? My ears gave out after listening to this. I could tell he was giving me more scolding. I just stood there looking at the sea with a shiver going down my entire body before I passed out. I woke up in the nursing room that was located right beside our lab and I had a high fever for a few days before I came back to the lab for work again. No, I don't have a nightmare about that or any trauma with water. I'm working just fine since I wasn't harmed in that incident. But still, I was terrified about going diving alone, especially at night for a few days. I wondered for quite some time about what might have transpired at that ship. Was it intentionally sunk, as if there was obvious signs of a planned massacre to become haunted? I didn't have any answers in my mind though. The good thing about all this is that I have stopped being reckless and going off my own to explore the sea. Instead, whatever I'm on a project, I take my entire team with me to avoid any further confrontation with ghostly things. And by the way, nothing's happened between me and that little crush of mine yet. Do we always go camping? Why do I have to go there for the school trip too? Please mom, I want to stay at home and play video games for once. I whined, following around my mom who was busy doing house chores. Your school manipulated me into paying your camping fees. There's no way I'm going to let you go in vain, she said in a strict voice while loading clothes into the washing machine. But mom... No buts. You're going there. End of conversation. Now move along. I have plenty of work on my hands. She walked off after finishing her sentence, and I couldn't help but helplessly sigh. I was never fond of things like camping trips and wilderness, but since this was the only idea of fun my family ever came up with every single holiday break, I had no other choice but to attend it. What crossed the limit when even my school organized the very same thing I had grown tired of, and my mom being a pushover handed the money to Miss Sandra, who was the teacher in charge of this trip. Now she was pushing me to go there. Finally the day arrived, and after dropping me off at school with my luggage, mom went to work. I wanted to run off right then and there, but I don't see why I hesitated. My friends Paul and Robert spotted me, and as they were coming to me, I could see their faces beaming up looking at how I was finally tagging along after clearly telling them that I didn't want to go. We went to the bus, and after putting our bags down, we took our seats. We reached the campsite at noon, and after having lunch, the teacher started with the activities they had planned. But the things they were making us do was utterly boring, as I had already grown tired of them after doing all of them multiple times with my cousins. Things took a turn when they made us do a scavenger hunt right before sunset. They hid cooking items around the area, and gave each team the task of searching for them and making food for the team. The one who was to finish their meal first would be the winner. During the hunt, two kids, Marcus and Luca from different teams, came across the same item. Arguments started about who got there first, while none of them let the other party take it. As the commotion grabbed my attention, I stopped whatever I was doing and went there to see what was going on. I stood there watching the small argument turn into a heated one without any intention of stepping forward and stopping them, as this seemed to be the only interesting thing about the entire trip. Marcus's hair ended up in Luca's fist, and he said something that I couldn't quite understand which pissed him off. Within a matter of time, the fight turned violent, and each one of them was eating dirt by the other's hand. By the time teachers and the rest of the kids took notice, they have started bleeding from their noses, along with multiple bruises on their bodies. They were immediately taken inside of one of the tents and got first aid treatment. I don't think any of the kids knew half as much as I did after all those trips with my family, otherwise they wouldn't have done something as foolish as this. 
Camping was no easy thing for those who haven't done it before, and having those injuries was only going to make it worse for the rest of the trip for those two. I was determined to not give a damn about whatever transpired around me, so I shrugged it off and went back to getting bored. After such a brutal fight, one might think they were done with each other and might have probably learned their lesson, but that wasn't the case at all. It was when we were taking a dip in the lake when Marcus and Lucas started a speech fight again, but stopped after receiving a scolding from the teacher, and she gave them another warning before heading to the camping area for something. About half an hour had already passed since I had started to swim, so I followed her to the camping area and got into my tent to change into a new pair of clothes. When I got out of the tent, I saw Miss Sandra setting up the food on the mat. Isaac, can you be a deer and the other kids for lunch? The food's prepared? I nodded my head in response as she noticed me looking in the direction and asked me. Following her order, I went ahead and started calling the scattered kids one by one. When I got back, I noticed everyone was present near the mat except for Marcus and Luca. Something felt off. I remembered I last saw them swimming in the lake, but not after that. My eyes met with Miss Sandra, and judging by her expression, she was thinking the same as me. We both ran toward the lake and started looking for them when I found a panicked Marcus hiding behind a tree near the lake, but there was no sign of Luca. As he saw us, he started crying and pointing toward the lake where Luca was last swimming along with repeating his name. This was the first time I felt thankful for all those trips and adventures with my family that taught me so many things. I immediately ran in that direction and dived upon reaching. Luckily, I found him drowning, and since he hadn't gotten too deep yet, I was able to pull him out. The teacher immediately started compressing his chest and performing CPR and after a few failed attempts, he threw up a lot of water along with coughing. Since he was in urgent need of medical attention, she drove him to the nearest hospital she knew of, leaving us in the care of Mr. Goodman. Marcus confessed to him later on that they started to argue again, and when Luca slapped him, he got so angry that he started beating him in the water. He couldn't understand if his foot slipped or something else, but in the middle of the grapple, Luca started drowning. He didn't say anything after that and just started crying again, so none of us knows if he tried to save him or ran away after getting panicked. The trip ended there and we were brought back home safely. I immediately rushed to tell mom about everything that went on the trip, which made me scared for her, and she promised never to send me off to another school trip. I don't know about that. I mean, whatever happened was horrifying indeed, and I'm thankful that Luca is safe now. But for some reason, this was the most memorable and unique camping trip I had experienced. Sometimes I wonder why in the world did I have to be born with such a stroke of tough luck? No kidding, I'm the kind of guy whose day won't go by without experiencing something hapless for the day. Whenever my day goes even a bit better, the next one goes worse than others. Sometimes I feel like I'm a magnet to all the bad luck in the world. If someone saw me, they would think of the day when it rained on my way back to the apartment, making me completely drenched, and then some car splashed water all over me as it drove away, to be the worst day of my life. And even though I did catch a cold after that, I had seen worse days to be bothered by that one. But little did I know back then that my ill fate had a little surprise for me hidden in its pocket. Something that would change the course of my life. Well, with Corona being back and forth, no one wanted a coughing employee in the office, so I had to take leave for the time I was sick. It took three days for my cold to get better, and as soon as it did, I was finally ready to resume my work. But just like Milo Murphy, my backpack had most of the precautionary measures for the situation I could end up in, and so I added an umbrella to it too, just in case it were to rain again. After dressing up and having my breakfast, I exited the house, locked it after me, and decided to walk, not to take my old car again, since it could break down any minute on the road. Yes, if you're wondering, I was that unlucky. I wasn't surprised to see that nothing happened on my way to the office, throughout working hours or when I got off work, but I was a little scared when I wasn't faced with any grim situation the entire day, 
and realized that the next day was going to go worse than it was supposed to. Nothing of such sort happened the next day, either raising my concern over it since it had never happened before. Two days in a row, it could only mean that the third day was going to get disastrous and my fright meter was only getting higher. I was jumpy all day, overthinking every little thing that could go wrong, but no dreadful event happened that day either. At this point, a thought crossed my mind. What if my fate had finally taken a turn? Well, it was instantly taken over by the terrible feeling of something very bad could happen on the fourth day. When the next three days went unusually normal as well, I was like, maybe my luck really has changed, and maybe I was just overthinking things. I still decided to wait for the day to end to get my jittery feeling. It was about 10 p.m. when I finally thought of treating myself for almost completing a week without getting in any sort of trouble. So I got out of the house at night without thinking of consequences and walked to the Popeye's chicken outlet that was around the block. They usually close by that time, but on Saturdays they would be open till 11.30 p.m. So when I got there, I realized once again that my luck hasn't run out yet. I ordered the most expensive meal on the menu and savored every single bite of it with joy in my heart, since having days like this was kind of a big deal for me. After I was done eating, I ordered another one for the takeout and started waiting for it to be prepared. As I was doing that, I thought while I was at it, I should treat myself to a little more because you never know if I could go back to the same old crappy days again. I took my field and decided to rent some spicy stuff from the local DVD store. But as I was walking there, I saw a man squatting down around the parking area doing something. And since it was so dark, I couldn't figure out what it was from the distance. So I decided to walk a bit closer to see if the poor man needed any help. But as I did, my heart dropped, and the emotion of regret started to take over my senses. The feeling that stayed here would bring me no good was so strong and even in such a dire situation, my legs just decided to go numb. The man felt my presence and turned to me. Trust me when I say this, but the moment this man's eyes met mine, he lit up and his mouth formed the evilest toothy grin I had ever seen in my entire life. I was regretting my decision to ever go out of my apartment this late at night as I looked at the bloody knife he was holding in his hand and the man lying in front of him who was stabbed to death. Who's there? It was the store clerk's voice who I recognized pretty well and before I could turn to tell the guy, I heard the word catch and automatically my hand caught the knife he threw at me, resulting in blood splattering all over my face in the process. Before I could scream or say anything, he disappeared, and the clerk flashed the light on my face which followed his face to go through the same expressions I went through a few minutes ago. No, 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 I didn't do this. As I said those words, he ran to the store and called 911 on me. I couldn't understand what to do. There were no security cameras installed there. I had no idea how to prove my innocence. My hands and legs were shivering like crazy by now. There was no way I was going to run away in that situation, so I decided to stay and try to explain to the cops what had transpired there. But now I understand why my luck was going so well for the past week. It was because of this point when I got framed for murder by a psychotic stranger. Without believing a word I said, I was immediately taken into custody, and the body was taken for autopsy. Adding to my dread, no fingerprints were found on the body, and only mine were found on the murder weapon, the knife which I foolishly caught when the actual murderer threw it at me. Only if I had let it stab me, maybe I would have survived, and even if it didn't, at least I wouldn't be charged for something I didn't do. I was declared the culprit and was sentenced to 28 years of prison life, even after my multiple pleas of being innocent. And as here I am serving my sentence, I know that man must be committing some heinous crime and getting away with it. Oh, how I wish for that man to die such a death even he wouldn't have imagined it. Messages from my ex. My name is Spencer Green. I'm a 27-year-old baker who works in East Manhattan. Oh no, I'm not an unhappy single man. I married the love of my life, Lucy, two years ago. 
and have a newly born gorgeous daughter with her. Anyway, the incident I'm about to tell you is something that happened the year I met Lucy. That was five years ago. I got reminded of it in the morning when I was working in the bakery and heard two young lads talking about getting into a Facebook scam. No, my story is not related to a Facebook scam, but yeah, it's related to Facebook though. It was one night when I was scrolling through Facebook when I received the notification that said that someone had sent me a message. I checked and it was from the girl I dated in the final years of high school, Mary. And the reason that I broke up with her was that I caught her cheating on me with not just one, but two other guys. Now, Mary is someone I still don't want to have anything to do with or even a formative conversation with, so I ignored her text. I don't know why I didn't think of blocking her right away, but I should have. I continued scrolling through my phone, and that's when I got the urge to use the bathroom. So I put my phone down and went over to do my business. On my return, when I checked the phone, there were 20 message notifications from her, in which she was apologizing and saying that she would do anything to have me back, including things like she knows that I still have feelings for her, and that was the reason I did not block her right away, knowing that it was her. And I thought that if she thinks that that was the case for me not blocking her, then I should do it right away. After blocking her, I went over to scrolling through Facebook and that's when I got another notification. I got a text from a different account and it was Mary again. And she was angrily asking me, how dare I block her? Again, I did not reply to any of her messages and just blocked her right away, giving her the hint that I wanted nothing to do with her which she did not get because two days later, I got another message from a different account and the message read, no matter how many times you push me away, I will keep coming back and breaking your boundaries because I love you. I know what she might be thinking while sending this. She might be thinking that this is somewhat romantic, but it was not. I only found it creepy. This time I got frustrated by the constant messages, so I decided to reply. I think I made it very clear that I do not want anything to do with you, so stop with your messages. It's irritating me. After this text, I blocked her again. For a few days, I did not receive any more messages on Facebook, so I thought that she finally gave it a rest. But one day, when I went home from work feeling tired, I found the lock of my front gate broken. So I immediately ran inside and searched around to see who broke in. The moment I walked into my bedroom, fixation filled my mind from what I was looking at. It was Mary. She had decorated my room with red roses and she was lying on my bed in the scud herself. That sight was sickening in itself just to make me feel nauseated. I quietly walked over and grabbed her hand. She looked at me smiling and thinking I would get seduced by her nastiness, but I jolted her from my bed and dragged her outside. After doing that, I went to my room, collected her clothes, and then went back to throw them on her face. I'm leaving you just by a simple warning, but if you do something like this again, I will report you for breaking into my house. As I said that, she stood there while looking at me with a mortified look. It was good if she felt embarrassed by her actions. She should have been, but I don't think she felt that way. Instead, she felt humiliated enough to falsely report me for something I did not do. The next day, two police officers came to my house to question whether or not I harassed my girlfriend. I immediately understood what was going on and tried explaining every single detail to the officers about what had happened, but instead of believing any of my words, they gave me a warning that it should not happen again. I could not believe how low she stooped just to make me sleep with her. All I could think about was how to get out of this situation. I changed the lock and installed the security lock along with a camera on my front door, just so that if she breaks in again, I would have proof. The same evening, I got another message on Facebook from a new account. I knew it was her, so I checked what she had to say now. The message read, I told you, I would come back and break your boundaries, didn't I? I immediately took a screenshot of this just in case, but I still had no idea how to prove myself innocent if she falsely accuses me of harassment again. The next day, I was working in the bakery with an absent mind which the owner took notice of and then asked me to take a break. So I went ahead and sat down in the customer area thinking about everything that had been going on lately. Is there something wrong? 
I heard a sweet soft voice of a girl and raised my head to see her. She was sitting on the table beside mine and looking at me with a concerned expression. Why do you ask? I did not want to deal with another woman, so I asked in a rude tone. No, it's just that I've been sitting here for the past half an hour and watching you that you haven't even touched your coffee during that time, she said, and looked over at my coffee which had become cold by now. It's just a legal situation. I don't think you'd be able to help me, I said, and got ready to leave the table. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I forgot to introduce myself. Hi, I'm Sergeant Lucinda Benson. She reached her hand out after saying that, along with a kind smile on her face, which made me look at her in awe. I'm sorry for being rude. My name is Spencer Green. It's a pleasure meeting you. I said and sat back on the chair. After that, I discussed with her the problem that I was facing and how the girl was falsely accusing me of something that I never did. Lucinda was very mature, and the solution she provided with me was something a person with logic and common sense would easily come up with, but I was in a state of panic, so I never thought about it. The first thing she told me was to stay calm and that there was no need to panic, especially since I had done nothing wrong. Then she told me that I need to hire an attorney if she were to file any charges against me, because it would be more helpful if I have an experienced attorney advocating for me, and above all, I needed to gather evidence against her. She explained many things along the lines about someone who had been falsely accused and how they could defend themselves. After that, she gave me her number and told me that I could contact her anytime I needed advice or help. As I reached home, I opened Facebook and texted Mary that I have enough proof to claim that I never did anything to her and I can report her for not only harassing, blackmailing, and even breaking into my house, but she would face charges of defamation as well. I made sure to take a screenshot of her chats, and surprisingly, she did not give any respond after that. It must be because she did not think this through before falsely accusing me. One thing that came out as well from this experience was that I met Lucinda. I asked her out on a few dates after that, and after being in a relationship for a long time, I proposed to her. A baker ended up marrying a sergeant. Pretty cool, right? I know that with Lucy by my side, I won't ever need to face someone like that ever again. I don't know how long it has been since I got stuck in this basement. You may be thinking, who am I? And why am I stuck here? Well, I'm just an ordinary guy who is in love with this woman. Her name is Sarah. She's my best friend's wife. If I were to explain the whole incident in details, I would have to tell you the story from the beginning. This story starts when Sarah, Jack, and I were all friends and nobody had married anyone. Jack always had a crush on Sarah, and eventually they got into a relationship. At first, I did not have any romantic feelings towards Sarah, but one day the three of us went on a trip, and during that very trip, I fell in love with Sarah and ended up being obsessed with her. Let's start from the very beginning when I first saw Sarah. It was a day when Jack was talking about the new girl he had a crush on, and we were in the cafeteria to have some lunch. He was telling me that, you know the new girl that transferred, the one I have a crush on? She's just unbelievably nice. The other day I was walking past her classroom and I saw her helping a fellow student with her note, even though she's new. Hey, here she comes. That's the girl I was talking about. He pointed his finger towards the gate of the cafeteria, and I saw this tall girl walking by. She had a long, silky, straight hair that was red, and she had blue eyes. She was very thin for a girl, and she was in a tomboy attire. She didn't look that appealing to me, but I couldn't say anything to Jack because he was free to have a crush on anyone he wanted. Jack was a very socializing person, so he instantly called Sarah and asked her to have lunch with us. Hi, I'm Jack, and this is my friend Edmund. You are the new girl, right? Do you want to have lunch with us? As she came over to our seat, he started talking to her. She agreed, and while having lunch, we started talking. She wasn't that bad. We could be friends. That's what I thought. The three of us started to hang out together, and slowly we became good friends. Jack's crush started to grow, and one day, he told me that he's falling in love with her. He asked me if he should confess to her. 
At the time, I was in support with Jack, so I told him, Don't worry, dude. Go ahead. I got your back. Jack smiled from my response. Of course, he was my best friend, and I would have always supported him. The next day, school had just started. That was when Jack walked in with Sarah in the class while holding hands. They told me that Jack confessed and they had started to date. Everything was normal except for the fact that Jack and Sarah were dating now. After about six months or so, we planned to go on a trip. It was supposed to be a camping trip. We took permission from our parents and started to prepare for the trip. After the preparations were complete, we headed out. And during the trip, Jack and Sarah started to argue for some reason. And even during the camping, they were not talking to each other. I woke up in the middle of the night and I was feeling uneasy, so I thought that I should take a walk. When I was walking, I saw Sarah sitting beside a tree and she was crying. I went ahead and started to console her, and she leaned her head over to my shoulder and continued crying. That was the first time when I looked at Sarah's blue eyes and they were red from crying. Her eyelashes were wet and her mascara had a smudge. I felt something in my heart. That was the first time when I thought that Sarah was the most beautiful woman in the world. After the thought crossed my mind, I instantly pulled myself away from Sarah and went inside my tent. That entire night, I couldn't sleep. I was only thinking about her. The next day, Jack and Sarah made up, and she looked happy. Seeing her bright smile made my heart beat even faster than the last night. I couldn't help but feel jealous of Jack, because Sarah chose him. But I did not want to hurt Jack, so I decided to never let anyone know. But my plan failed soon after, when I saw Jack and Sarah kissing. For some reason, I was so angry and jealous that I wanted to hurt Jack. But he was my best friend, so I gathered my thoughts and calmed myself down. A year went by and it was finally the graduation day. Jack had decided to propose to Sarah after the graduation ceremony. For some reason, I was hoping that Sarah says no, but since Sarah was in love with him, she accepted. They married a month later, and I started to have anger issues. I got angry for every little thing. I would sometimes beat a complete stranger who had pissed me off. I could not gather the courage to attend their marriage ceremony. Instead, I was at my home drinking the entire time and thought that I had lost Sarah for life. But then, a plan came to my mind. I thought, what if Sarah were to lose her husband? She would be devastated, and I would be the one to console her that night, and I would make her fall in love with me. I started to stalk them. Whenever Jack and Sarah both were together or were on a date, I would always follow them without letting them know. And when Sarah was alone and Jack was at work, I would watch Sarah. I memorized the entire routine. They used to go on Tuesday evenings for dinner dates and movies on Saturday. Apart from those days, Sarah was always alone at home and I would watch her. After Jack left for work, she would do some house chores, laundry, etc., and when the housework was complete, she would open her laptop and start working on it. But one day, she decided to join a gym. On the third day of her gym, when she could not do pull-ups, her trainer grabbed her waist and made her do the entire set of pull-ups. I got furious from that. I thought even I never touched her, so how dare he grab her waist? Sarah left after working out, but I waited until the trainer left for his home. He was walking past an abandoned building when I hit his head with a big stone that I had grabbed before following him. He stumbled. That was when I hit him again on his head with the same stone. He fell. I continued hitting him while he was groaning from pain. I kept hitting him till he passed out. I was mad. I was furious by the fact that Sarah married Jack and then made love and how Jack could touch her and kiss her whenever he wanted. I was furious that his trainer was able to grab her wrist when I never touched even her hands. After I finished hitting him, I checked, and he was dead. I had killed him, but I was not regretting it for some reason. That was when I thought 
This is the perfect time for me to kill Jack. I followed Jack to his home when Sarah was in the bathroom. After Jack went inside his home, I rang the doorbell. Jack opened the door and he looked happy to see me. Buddy, long time no see. Come inside. Tell me, how are you doing? Wait a second, let me grab the beer from the kitchen. As he was talking, I followed him to the kitchen and grabbed the knife from the counter. He was opening the fridge when I stabbed him in the back and kept stabbing. That was when I noticed the footsteps of Sarah coming toward the kitchen and immediately tried to hide myself. While I was hiding, I heard Sarah scream and then I heard her calling 911. When the police arrived, I wasn't able to get out of the house, so I somehow managed to hide in the basement. I don't know, I think a day had passed. I cannot figure out how long has it been since I got stuck here. I can hear the wailing sound of police siren. I can hear that the search is going on. I guess they're trying to find evidences regarding the murder, and I have no idea if I will be able to get out of here or I will get caught. I was aware of the possibility of getting caught from the day I decided to kill Jack, and from the day I started stalking them. I've been running and hiding for the past two hours, but I can't seem to shake them off my trail. My legs are about to give up, but if I don't outrun them, they're going to kill me. Crying for help isn't even an option anymore, because if I scream, the only thing that I'll do is give them away my exact location. My name is Sarah Delfino. I'm a sophomore in high school. The reason I'm cutting my life has to do a little something with my boyfriend asking me out on a camping trip, which was three days ago. My classes had just ended, and I was walking toward the exit along with my best friend Ella, when my eyes caught a familiar figure waiting outside for me. There was no way I wouldn't recognize that doofus, even if he was hiding among the crowds of students rushing outside. The way he was looking around seemed like he didn't see me yet, and as I walked a bit further, maintaining the same pace as before, his eyes finally met mine, and his lips broke into a charming smile enough to melt any frozen heart. Mine wasn't frozen though, it's just the same. I walked to him only to see that he was holding a gift box. Another one? Didn't you just give me a gift this morning? I asked with a silly smile on my face. Well, it's your birthday, and you did say that I could do whatever I want for you on this day, he replied while scratching the back of his neck. How could anyone say no to this cute creature? So I took the gift he was grabbing, and after saying goodbye to Ella, I started walking home with Frederick. By the way, what brought you to my school? I'm sure it wasn't just for this, I asked, showing him the gift he bought. Yeah, you're right. I was thinking since tomorrow's Saturday and it's your birthday today, so why don't we go on a camping trip? Just the two of us. Judging by the way he was fiddling with his fingers, I could tell how nervous he was. Sure. He was ready to say something, but as I agreed, he looked at me with bright, surprised eyes. Guess he thought I would say no. Anyway. So we walked to my house while talking about the trip and what preparations we needed. And once we got there, I gave him a goodbye kiss before heading inside my house. My parents knew about him and trusted him more than their daughter. Looking at how his family was friends with Aunt Helena, that was why when I asked them for permission, they didn't hesitate once and allowed it. We started our drive to the nearest woods the next morning at 7, and it almost took us 5 hours to reach there. After setting up our camps in a safe place, we started discussing what to do next, and that was when an idea popped in my mind. I told him that we should play treasure hunt. He would hide some of his things across the perimeter, and I would do the same with mine. Each would only hunt the thing that the other person had hidden. Yeah, I know it's childish, but how the two of us were with each other, silly and childish. Anyway, so he acknowledged my idea, and we started playing. As I was looking around the bushes and trees to search for the things Frederick had hidden, I couldn't help but feel that I was being watched. I turned around multiple times to see if anyone was there, but there wasn't. But the feeling of someone watching me didn't go away, even after a few minutes. So I stopped the treasure hunt and went to the area where my boyfriend was. I told him about it, and he took me back to the camp, stopping the game right that instant. A few hours passed and nothing out of the ordinary seemed to happen, so we figured it must be some wild animal that I mistook for someone. 
we had been on a few camping trips before and had been there once as well, so we knew that there have been a few coyote sightings around the area. Apart from that, we never brought more than two bottles since we knew there were always water sources around there that we could fill up the drinking water. So a few hours later, when we were taking a well-known path to the creek to get some water, we spotted two men who were walking towards us, possibly for the same reason we were here for. They gave me a strange look, and then passed a smile which made me feel uncomfortable and disturbed to a fault. But I tried to ignore it, thinking they might be trying to act friendly. Any doubt I had was removed when instead of filling water in their container, they approached me and tried to become needlessly uncomfortable. Their over-friendliness pissed Frederick off, so he asked them to just back off. But instead of feeling threatened, it just pissed them off. One of the two men shoved him to the tree and punched him in the guts, making him grunt with pain. At this point, I knew they were no ordinary men, but instead some sort of thugs. That's when the other man grabbed me, causing me to squeak at the sudden force applied to my waist, while one held Frederick down, preventing him to do anything. The seriousness of the situation sent shivers down my spine, but I tried to establish my ground by acting as calm as possible. I tried to ask them politely to let us go. We didn't want any trouble, but they looked at me like I was speaking gibberish and started laughing. They dragged the two of us to their camps, where a few other were like them, and by the looks of it, they were some bike gang members. This was where the real nightmare started, as they started touching me in appropriate places and tried to do unexplainable things to me right before Frederick's eyes. Helpless tears started falling through his eyes watching all of that while he screamed and threatened them to let me go. At some point, he managed to break free and beat a few men who were on me, and we started running from there. I was too horrified by everything that I could do nothing but shake and cry. As the two of us were running away, I heard a few gunshots and turned my side to see Frederick fall. I tried to get him up and run with me, but before he could, another bullet was straight fired to his head, snatching his life away. My legs started to feel numb. My breathing started to get haggard as I saw the lifeless body of the man I love. But there was nothing I could do anymore. If I were to stay there any longer, they would catch me again and do all those nasty things to me what they failed to do before because of Frederick. So I got up and started running. It had been about two hours now, and they were still on my trails. I know I'm not too far from the road. Just a bit further and I'll be there. I kept running in the direction where I knew where the road was. <sighs> Finally, I'm here now. I just need to find some help. Reaching the road, I looked around panting, but as I was suddenly run in the middle of the road, I didn't see the truck coming straight in my direction it crashed into me. Now as I think I'm on the verge of my death, it's okay to die like this. They took away my treasure anyway. I'm thankful that at the very least, they couldn't do anything to me, and that I got away from those dirty men. Winter nights are always dark and creepy each year. If someone asks my personal opinion, I would always say that I don't like the winter season. The cold breeze and the dark, creepy, lonely roads. Also, something very bad happened to someone I know that shook me from head to toe. That incident left a fear in my heart that remains active even now. Like always, this time again, the mist started getting deeper and there was a silence all around. Jason was well aware of what was going to happen next, but still don't know due to this fear his heart started beating fast. Along with the mist, the cold also started increasing, and Jason started shivering. It seemed that the whole world was covered with a white snowy sheet. Suddenly, a black shadow appeared in the middle of the fog, which slowly started moving toward Jason. Even knowing that there was no danger to him, Jason wanted to turn around and run away, but he felt that his feet were frozen there. The shadow came near Jason, and his face was clearly visible. It was the same face he had seen for the first time on that unforgettable night. He had the innocent face of an about 14-year-old boy. He pointed his finger toward him. 
Jason sweated profusely out of fear despite the cold. The boy accused him that you hit me and you're responsible for my death. You will have to atone for this. You will have to pay the price for my death. Jason began to reply and wanted to object that he didn't do anything. But as usual, the boy disappeared into the mist before he could say anything. Jason was shocked and his body was wet with sweat. He knew that now he would not be able to sleep for hours. He also knew that he would never forget that night. After that day, these dreadful dreams became a usual routine for Jason. The day when this incident happened was a great day for Jason. He was at a party that he organized by his boss and all the staff members were there. The hall was packed. The party was going on very loudly. People were dancing to foreign music, but nothing could be heard properly due to the noise of conversation. The wine was flowing like water. Standing in a corner, Jason was watching the spectacle without any special interest. Jason's friend Jack came up to him and tried to hand him a glass of wine to drink and come dance and enjoy with him and others. But Jason was not in the mood after that incident. At first, he tried to ignore Jack as he was already drunk and was not in a condition to understand anything. He kept on refusing, but Jack didn't agree. Finally, being fed up with all this forcing, Jason reluctantly took the glass, but he drank only a little to show Jack that he was drinking, which had almost no effect on him. Slowly, the night was over, and Jason went to the parking to his car. He pulled out his car from the hotel parking and drove towards his house. There was a slight fog, but the road was clearly visible. He was driving a little faster than usual, since the road was not too crowded. After driving for a few minutes, he reached a traffic light where he saw the light turn green at the intersection in front of him, so he didn't reduce the speed. Suddenly, a boy started crossing the road right in front of him while talking on his cell phone. Jason pressed the brake pedal hard, but by then, it was too late. The car hit the boy, and he was thrown a few meters ahead due to the impact. Jason stopped the car and ran to the boy. He looked at his face carefully. His eyes were closed and he seemed unconscious. Jason picked him up and put him in the car and went toward the nearest hospital. But then it dawned on him that if he confessed and the police found alcohol on his breath, he might have to go to jail. Thinking that Jason stopped the car some distance from the emergency ward of the hospital and picked up the young man inside, he handed over the boy to a ward boy there. He said, and ran away from there after saying that he would return after a few minutes. The next day, he read in the inside corner of the newspaper that some unknown person had left the body of a half-dead boy in the hospital and then disappeared from there. After that day, he started having hazy dreams. Jason lived with his widowed mother. The little change that took place in his everyday life because of these dreams he could not hide from his mother's eyes. But whenever she asked any questions in this matter, Jason used to avoid the matter. Jason was 24 years old and was working in a reputed company. His mother wanted him to get married as soon as possible to get a companion for her to talk with in her lonely time. But Jason was not thinking of getting married after that accident. The only thing he could think of that used to come to his mind again and again was that he had killed someone by his carelessness. To forget his fault, Jason started working day and night. During the day, his attention was distracted in his office, but at night, especially after having a foggy dream, he was overwhelmed with sadness. After that party night, he never touched alcohol and stopped serving alcohol even at company parties. Somehow, six months passed after the incident, and a new girl joined Jason's office. Her name was Alice and she had come to work straight after her graduation. In other words, she was a fresher, and Jason was entrusted with the responsibility of making Alice understand her work. She was very intelligent, and also had the enthusiasm to learn. Jason was very happy with his dedication. Gradually, Jason started getting attracted to Alice, and he started feeling that Alice could become an ideal life partner for him, but he couldn't let Alice know about his feelings all day. After a few days, Jason got a chance to have tea with Alice. 
It was announced in his office that the next day in the evening, the roads would be closed to a big procession in the city, so there would be a holiday in the office two hours earlier. Taking advantage of the opportunity, Jason informed Alice that the next day, he would accompany Alice to her house. The next evening, at 4 o'clock when he got to leave, Jason took Alice and went towards her house. On the way, he tried to get information about Alice from her. While talking about her family, Alice revealed that she had a brother who died in an accident last year and almost broke while talking about her dead brother. Jason felt as if he had scratched an old wound and apologized to her. Soon, they reached Alice's house. Her parents welcomed him in a nice and respectful manner. Her father had retired from the British Army after serving for almost 35 years. Sitting in the meeting, he and Jason started talking about the upcoming elections and some other political issues. Alice and her mother went inside and started arranging tea and some snacks. Jason's eyes were wandering here and there while talking, and suddenly, he got a big jolt and was shocked when he saw his left side. There was a big picture on the front wall on which a garland was lying. Actually, it was the same boy who came under Jason's car. He was shocked even then. He asked Alice's father who was in that photo. Her father became completely silent, and then he replied in a broken voice that he was his only son who died in an accident last year. Jason's head started spinning, and his eyes almost burst with tears. He started thinking that he killed Alice's brother. He was the one who took their only hope from them and he was thinking of getting married to her sister. Though he didn't know about all that from start even then, murder was murder. He had killed that boy and he was sure of it, but he didn't have the courage to confess so. Like before, he excused them that he had urgent work to do at home and left from there as soon as he could. After that, he started to avoid Alice even during office. He was feeling guilty about killing his brother so he wanted to keep his distance from her. They went on for almost about one month, but then Alice got fed up with his behavior and asked him directly if he had some problem with her. She was furious due to Jason's ignorance and behavior. Jason thought that he couldn't hide this fact anymore from her and decided to confess to her about everything. He asked her to sit beside her and told her that he wanted to confess something. He told her that he did something that couldn't be forgiven no matter how he repented. She couldn't understand what he was trying to say, so she asked her to tell her everything clearly. Jason looked at her face and asked, Do you know how your brother died? He was hoping that she wasn't aware of anything, but she replied that she knew all about it. He was shocked to listen to her reply. Before he could say or ask anything else, she said that her brother had gone for a swim immediately after lunch. Suddenly, his stomach started twitching in the pool and he died by drowning. His friends and the lifeguard present there tried hard to save him, but perhaps the time had come for his death. Jason was shocked to hear this. He wasn't expecting something like that. He asked Alice if her father told him that her brother died in an accident. After this, Alice told him that just a week back, he had come in the way of a car while busy talking on his cell phone, but it seemed that some decent person was driving the car because even though it was not his fault, he took my brother to the hospital and then disappeared. He was saved in that accident, but died after just six days in the swimming pool. Jason felt as if a mountain had lifted from his head. At this time, he thought that he had killed that boy but actually the boy was saved that day, and these six months that passed like a hell for Jason were for nothing but a misunderstanding. He was very happy to know the truth. He confessed to Alice that he was the one who hit his brother that day with car and left him at the hospital, as he was scared of getting arrested. He also told her that he left her house that day because he saw her brother's photo and thought it was him who killed him. He burst into tears while confessing all this. Alice held him and hugged him tightly. She told him that everything was just a misunderstanding and asked him to forget everything. After a few minutes, she confessed to him her feelings towards him, and Jason also confessed to her about his feelings. Just after that, in his mind, he promised himself that the very next day, 
he would go to Alice's house and meet her parents and ask for Alice's hand, and he was sure that after that day, he would never have that dreadful dream again. After this, both of them got married and lived their life happily without any tensions or worries. I know I'm going to win no matter what today. As I said that to Carlos, he started to laugh. You know only an expert or pro player can win this game, right? He said while trying to control his laughter, for which he had started to get on my nerves now. I was never one to play games or take any sort of interest in them ever, but Carlos was the one who always used to play games, and he also was the one who introduced me to the game Minecraft, saying that it was fascinating. At first, I only played it when he forced me into it, but soon after that, it started to catch my attention for being so interesting, and I started playing it on a regular basis. Carlos was my roommate and a pro player since he had always stuck his head in games so he could win the game after a few tries, but I, on the other hand, was not able to win, so I started obsessing over it and started to give my complete focus on the game. My sole motive was to win this game, but Carlos started to get annoyed with me. Instead of helping me with the games, he continued to mock me and make fun of me for always losing. One day, he brought over his gaming friends and asked me to play a game with them. He told me that it would be fun and that it would not be about winning or losing, so I agreed while believing his words. As we were playing, he continued winning while I continued losing. Even after several hours of playing, I could not win one single game, and when we were all having pizza and beer, Carlos along with his friends started making fun of me for being a complete newbie. I tried maintaining my cool the entire time, but as they continued making fun of me, even when his friends were leaving, I finally lost it. Hey, sorry for that man, I know my friends went a bit overboard and, as he was saying that, I hit on his head with an empty beer bottle. He stumbled as blood started dripping all over the floor. Before he could maintain his balance, I dragged him and hit his end on his computer and continued hitting it. I guess he passed out, but I did not stop and went into the kitchen to bring a knife. Why did you say it? I'm a born loser, huh? Guess what? You won't be winning anymore either. As I said that, I continuously stabbed him in his lower waist and then chest as he stopped breathing. When my temper cooled down, I realized what I had done. I went and started playing Minecraft for some reason, and surprisingly, I won this time for the first time. I felt happy, and went ahead to grab the head of Carlos's lifeless body. I turned it toward the screen and showed him while saying, Look, I'm the winner now. Laugh if you can. As I said that, I started laughing like a maniac. After that, I realized that I had to hide Carlos's body, so I cut it into multiple pieces, wrapped it in many bags, and one by one threw it in the nearby river overnight. The next day I played again, but I lost. Thinking it must be just one lost game, I played multiple times and kept losing. So I thought of many possibilities of losing the game, and finally came up with the solution. I thought that the reason I won the game was the murder of Carlos, and I had to keep killing people. The next day, I killed a stranger after following him when he was going home through a secluded area from the gaming cafe and left his body hidden in the park. I was careful not to leave any evidence that points to the murder on me. After that, I went back to my apartment and started playing the game. But after spending hours, even an entire night and day, I could not win the game. That was when I concluded that the reason for my win was to kill a pro player, because that would give me the satisfaction of removing one of those pests on the face of this earth. I remembered that Carlos's friends were pro players, so I texted one of them from Carlos's number and asked him to come over to play the game. He agreed, while saying that he wanted to make fun of Carlos's loser friend with them, which made me furious. The following evening, the doorbell of my apartment rang. I knew it was him, so I went ahead and opened it. After entering the apartment, he asked me about Carlos, and I told him that Carlos was out buying drinks and edibles. 
he noticed that Carlos's PC wasn't there and asked me about it. As he turned toward me, I stabbed him in the chest with the knife I was already holding. I continued stabbing him till he died. After that, I went ahead, logged into the game, and started playing it. As I had already concluded, I won the game. I realized that after killing a pro player, I could only win once, and if I wanted to win the game again, I had to kill the rest of Carlos's friends one by one, killing a pro player and taking my revenge as well. After killing his body in the same way that I did to Carlos's, I took out his phone and saw the contact of another friend. I recognized him by looking at the profile picture that he was also one of the people who made fun of me. Hey, let's meet at Carlos's apartment and make fun of his loser friend who never wins Minecraft. I sent the text and waited for the reply. Hell yeah, dude. I've been dying to do that. So what's the plan? He replied after 10 minutes. I'll meet you directly at his apartment. So don't be late, okay? I threw his phone on the bed after sending that text. In my early 20s, I went through a wandering stage. I had just graduated from college and couldn't find a job anywhere. Rather than go a couple hundred dollars into the hole every month paying for rent while searching for a job, I decided to pack up with my few belongings I owned and headed out to see the country. And this is something I cannot recommend enough. Stay off the interstates, pop a train from time to time, and hitchhike with no particular destination in mind. It was this kind of aimless wandering that led me to the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. If you've never experienced them, the Barrens are an amazing place. Huge stands of oak and evergreen trees, many older than time itself, grow out of that strange, sickly soil. Sugar sand, the locals call it in the rainy season, that forms quicksand. And then the dry season, it can still swallow farm machinery whole. Of the few farms that I saw, they all looked like they had seen better times, and many looked like they had sat untouched for decades. There was something alluring about that place, a sort of ancient secret I was afforded glimpses of in the shadows when the wind stirred the trees, the sort of movement at the edge of your vision that follows you throughout the day, but disappears as soon as you turn your head. From time to time, I hiked down old dusty roads, an old pickup truck or a rusted out car would bound over a hill toward me. Most times, the driver would eye me suspiciously and speed up as they approached. Occasionally, the driver would stop to talk to me for a few minutes. What are you doing out here? One old toothless man clad in overalls asked me wandering around. Seeing what there is to see, I replied. The old man spat out a putrid brown stream into the dust. Ain't nothing to see around here. When I asked the old man what he meant by that, he made a guttural, throaty sound. I wasn't sure if he was choking on his tobacco or bothered by the question, but he didn't answer. He offered me a ride in his pickup the way that I had come back into town. But when I declined, he spat out into the dirt again and sped off, shaking his head. My eventual plan was to make it to Delaware sometime that summer and meet up with some extended family there, but I was in no hurry. In truth, I had been in heaven these last few weeks, taking my time heading south and exploring anything that caught my eye. I had explored every abandoned building and every cave I had seen. I had half my weight in power bars in my backpack. But over the last two months, I had honed my skills at trapping rabbits and gathering wild edibles. Sitting up late at night beside my campfire and sleeping beneath the stars. The night sky in an area so devoid of human influence is beyond comprehension. But tonight, there were clouds moving in, 
and the sun was disappearing faster than I had grown accustomed to. When the deep roar of thunder shook the valley, I knew that I had better find shelter. In the failing sunlight, I could see in the distance some structures at the top of the hill. I ran the half-mile distance and was disappointed to see that the ancient house and barn were in terrible shape. The roof of the barn had been completely collapsed, and the upper two floors of this three-story house had collapsed into a mangle of ancient wood. Still, the house was my best option, so I made my way toward it as the heavens began to open up. As I had seen on other properties in the area, this house had a small cemetery in the yard. I ran toward the gaping front door of the dilapidated house, carefully making my way between the headstones. When lightning flashed, I was able to make out the name on several of the headstones, which the elements hadn't completely erased. When they got inside, the floor was spongy, but felt solid enough to hold my weight. I took off my pack and set it near the door, caught my breath, and had a look around. The hinges of the front door had long since rusted away, but I was able to fit the door back into the opening enough to hopefully keep the wind and rain out. At one end of the room, there was a stone fireplace and chimney which was solidly constructed, but I had no wood for a fire. Next to the fireplace, was a stairwell full of rubble and cobwebs. I didn't dare apply my weight to those steps, as many had rotted to nothing under their own pitiful weight. Opposite the front door was an opening to an old kitchen of sorts, but when I tried to approach it, my foot went clean through the floor, and I decided to stay put until the storm blew over. The remains of the upper floor did an adequate job of keeping the ground floor dry, and I was able to arrange my sleeping bag so that very little water draining from the upper floors managed to land on it. I got out my harmonica and played for a few minutes, then stopped, apprehensive. I didn't know what I was afraid of, but something had chilled me to my core. Outside, the storm had continued to build in intensity. My eyes were focused on that stairwell, seeing nothing in darkness, and flash blinded when lightning struck. I must have fallen asleep at some point because suddenly I came to with a searing pain in my neck from leaning my head against the wall for so long. Outside, the storm continued to pound down its fury upon earth. As I sat there, rubbing my neck, and began to chuckle to myself for getting wrapped up in the superstition of the area when I heard it. At first, I heard indiscriminate movement of stairs, and the ruins of the upper two floors. I was just about to write it off as rats, when suddenly it stopped. I froze in place, daring only to move my eyes, and even then, just barely. After 30 seconds of paralytic fear, I smiled at myself again and was just about to settle into my sleeping bag when I looked toward the stairs. At the top of the doorway were a pair of glowing red orbs staring directly at me. Very slowly, they closed down to horizontal slits then opened up again wider than before. I can't tell you how long I sat there staring at it, staring at me. It could have been a second. It could have been hours. And eventually, my lower level self-preservation skills began to kick in. And subconsciously, I started reaching for the knife on my belt. Our eyes locked. My hand progressed inch by inch towards my only means of defending myself. Neither of us blinked for what felt like hours, and while the storm raged on, I prayed for another lightning strike so that I might even catch a glimpse of my adversary. But despite the ferocity of the rain, 
the darkness was absolute. When, at last, my hand reassuringly touched the hilt of my knife, it seemed as if the very fabric of existence was ripped to shreds. The creature began bellowing in the most unearthly, mind-numbing shriek I'd ever heard. Knowing I only had one chance, in one fluid motion, I released the snap that held my knife in place and released an inside overhand throw that I had practiced during my years of my misspent adolescence. I heard a sickening, wet thunk, and the shrieking increased in volume a hundredfold. As I smashed that rotten door to pieces, I heard the creature flapping against the wall and screaming. Just as I wrenched the remains of the door open, a great flash of lightning struck. And all around the house, I saw piles of bones, feathers, and fur. I ran as I had never run before, since I ran into my veins pumped acid and my limbs were stone. I couldn't see where I was going, but I could follow the dirt roads by the sounds of the sugar sand slipping roadside debris into the ditches. I didn't dare look over my shoulder. When the sun finally rose, I collapsed in the middle of the road. Heaving, oblivious to the downpour, I awoke with a startle to the sound of a car horn blaring inches from my head. I leaped to my feet and spun around to see the same old man from yesterday holding his sides with laughter. When I opened my mouth to speak, he motioned with his thumb to the back of his truck. I climbed in without a word, and he began to drive. The events of the previous night had began to replay themselves in my head. What had just happened? No matter how many times I considered what I saw, none of it made any sense. As we drove, I realized how far I had run in the dark. It must have been nearly ten miles. I was angry with myself for being so terrified by a dream. And that's the only thing that could have been approached from this angle. Everything fit into place and experienced to false awakening. There's so many times in the past when experimenting with dream herbs. I had a nightmare and woke up with adrenaline pumping and abandoned all of my gear in an old house. I suddenly realized that the truck had sat motionless for quite some time, and the old man was turned around in the seat, staring at me. I looked up at him, and he grinned. With sickening horror, I realized that we were at the bottom of the hill on which that wretched house sat. I jumped out of the pickup and thanked the old man who drove off. I slowly walked up the muddy path that led to the house composing myself. When I reached the yard, I saw the old piles of bones which had shocked me the previous night during the storm. Of course, there were coyotes and foxes in the area, and I had hunted a couple wild turkeys. The critters probably had their dens around here, and they had been using the house as a windbreak. Inside the house, everything appeared as I had left it. My sleeping bag, my pack, and my harmonica was sitting on the floor, and I could see my knife sticking out of the wall across the room. I packed everything up and put on my backpack, then walked over to the stairs and pulled my knife out of the wall. I was about to return it to the sheath on my belt when I looked at the blade and noticed the dried-on blood and that clump of oily black hair stuck to it. This incident happened to us when I was in the woods with my friend. His name was Samuel, and that was the last day when I saw him. We witnessed something inhuman in the woods and were afraid 
so we were returning as fast as we could, but in the process, I didn't notice that I had lost him, and after that day, he didn't return back to us. At that time, I lived in Selcone City, which was the last residential point before the vast and vast jungle in Brazil. A few miles from our city, there was this huge and dense forest that was spread over more than a hundred miles. My father was a police officer and was living about eight hours away from my place. I lived in my house along with my mother and my younger sister. My father was living with us until I turned 16, but then he was transferred to another area, and now we were here without him. It was not like we were having any difficulty or facing a lot of problems without him, but the point was that we missed him very much. He used to send enough money for us to leave our life full of facilities and comforts. When he was with us, he used to take me to the woods for hunting and fishing at the lake, which was several miles deep into the woods, but that was his favorite place for fishing. I had been there many times before and also knew the route. But since his transfer, I have never visited there even once. It was a normal day, and I was sitting in my hall and watching TV when my friend who lived in my neighborhood came running to me and asked me to go into the forest for some hunting and fishing. I was getting bored of sitting in my room and watching TV, so I thought that it would be a good opportunity to go and visit that place again. I agreed with him and was excited to go there. This was the first time I was going into the woods without him. I asked him to prepare our stuff and meet here again in the next 15 minutes. I went to my room and changed into my dad's hunting uniform and took the fishing rod along with a rifle that was for hunting and waited for my friend to come. He reached there after 20 minutes and apologized to me for keeping me waiting. I didn't mind that thing, and from there, we started our trip to the woods. It was a nice, sunny day, and the time was around 3 p.m. After half an hour, we reached the starting point of the forest, and then started our journey into the woods. As we walked into the woods, we found only vegetation that was growing even denser after every step. Back then, when I came here with my dad, this route was totally clear. But maybe we hadn't visited this forest for years, and in between, the bushes grew, and the result was right in front of our eyes. After walking for about an hour, we reached a very dense part of the forest that surrounded most of that area, and till that time, we were very tired and hungry. So, I asked my friend to take out some snacks that we carried to enjoy in the woods. We sat there and ate a little snack to get back into action, but with full energy. After this, we continued our search for my dad's favorite fishing place. We kept on walking ahead, but didn't find anything other than dense bushes and trees. It was getting harder to cut through the vegetation. But it seemed God heard our voices, and we heard the voice of flowing water. I knew for sure that it was the same spot where my dad always took me, and I was right about that. After clearing the bushes, we could easily see the lake. We were feeling very tired and completely exhausted so we decided to sit and rest for a while on the grass. We were resting there when my friend felt thirsty and went to the lake to drink some water. While drinking water, he noticed something on the opposite side of the lake. At first, he didn't see that clearly and ignored it, 
But as soon as he stood up after drinking water, he started to shake after watching what he saw there. I went to him and asked him what he saw, whether it was some wild animal or something. He didn't say anything, but pointed his fingers towards the opposite side of the lake. I looked there, and I couldn't explain to you what I saw there. We saw something that was out of our imagination, and was a totally inexplicable thing. On the other side of the lake, there was a small, clear, sand-made area, and imprinted on it was a huge footprint. It was really too huge, and we both knew that no normal human or animal could have made it. We were both too afraid and went there while shaking our boots. After reaching there, we came to know that the footprint was about 30 times greater in size than ours. We looked at that footprint clearly and examined it. Soon, we realized that it was completely inhuman, and we suddenly started to feel even more terror in our hearts. We rushed back without so much as a peep, and we kept on running through the dense bushes without looking back. After running continuously for about an hour, I reached outside the forest, and at that time, I realized that Samuel was not with me. I looked back and waited for him, since I thought he must have got caught or struck into the bushes. But several minutes passed, and he didn't return. I screamed and shouted his name so that he could identify my voice and come back to me, but everything was in vain. I waited for him for the next two hours, but when he didn't return back, I got worried about him and went running back to my home. I reached my home and called the cops and explained everything to them. They came to me after about 30 minutes and took a photograph of him. This time, I also told them about the footprint that I saw deep in the forest. They took all the information they needed from me and started their investigation. After that day, I waited for their call every day, but they didn't contact me ever again. And as far as my friend is concerned, he never returned to me ever again. Every time I explained this story to my other friends, they made fun of me, and they always asked me to take them with me to the same spot. But whatever that huge footprint belonged to, one thing was sure, that it scared the hell out of us. And also, even today, I kept on thinking about where in the world did my friend go. For the hunting season of 2017, I got in on a lease with a guy from work. I didn't have time to check the area out before the season started, so the inevitable occurred and I got lost my first day. That morning I left the camp just before dawn. I'm not the kind that hunts from a stand, I'm your traditional stalk and shoot type of hunter. Since I wasn't familiar with the lease and I stupidly left my GPS back at the camp, I had to stick to the main paths in order to not get lost. Most of the morning I did well. However, as I grew tired, I lost focus and veered from the trail. In my defense, I came across this really fresh set of tracks. Of course, I had to follow them. The sucky thing was that they continued on to a neighboring property and I had to stop following them. When I looked up, I realized I was way off the trail and didn't know how to get back. The rest of the day was spent trying to find my way back to camp. About an hour before dark, I noticed a rundown house and cabin in the distance. By now, I wasn't sure whose property I was on. I hoped that if somebody was living there, they could help me, but as I got closer, I could tell the place had been abandoned for a good while. I knocked to make sure, but with no reply, I made myself at home. My first goal was to get a fire going. 
After I did that, I began combing through the cabinets for food and other things I thought could help me. Not much but a questionable can of chili and some candles were found. I heated up the chili over the fire and combined it with a half-eaten bag of chips. After dinner, I looked through the bedroom and discovered an old map of the area. I wasn't sure how accurate it would be after all that time, but I was happy to find it. I spread it out on the floor in front of the fireplace and planned my course for the morning. I was shocked to see that I had veered over five miles from where I'd started. At some point, I must have dozed off. During the night, I had a super vivid dream that a man was sitting in the chair next to me and just staring. He never said a word. And when I jerked awake and saw that I was alone, I was relieved and quickly fell back asleep. The following morning, I woke up at 6.15 and got my stuff together. I made sure the fire was completely put out and headed back to camp. I just stepped from the house when I came face to face with a strange man. The guy from my dream, in fact. I was confused at first, and when he spoke, I knew my dream had really happened. This man was holding an old Marlin 3030. Not an odd sight for a hunter during deer season. This dude didn't look like a hunter, though. He wore an old, dirty backpack and normal, bright, yet dingy street clothes. His eyes had a very crazed look to them that made me uncomfortable to gaze at. I was surprised, but regained my calm and said, Good morning. Instead of saying it back, he just stared at me with those crazed black eyes. I began to say something, but he interrupted and asked what I was doing in the cabin. Before I could answer, he blurted out that it was his place. I continued and explained what had happened the day before. The entire time I was telling him this, he was gripping the rifle so tightly his knuckles were beginning to turn white. His behavior was beginning to scare me. The only thing I wanted to do was get back to camp and then home. The last word had barely left my lips before he angrily told me that it was his place. It appeared to have been empty for quite a while, but I wasn't going to argue with him. I apologized as quickly as I could and went on my way. For a good hundred yards or more, I kept looking behind me. I was waiting to get shot in the back. Every time I looked back, he was staring, maniacally, back at me and death gripping his gun. It took a couple of hours to find my way back, but by then, I'd had plenty of time to dwell upon our encounter and I was truly freaked out by then. It actually hit me. The guys that were still in camp were happy to see me and asked what had happened. I just said I got lost and camped out for the night, never mentioning the nutcase that I met. I doubt that they take it seriously anyhow. The whole experience had me so scared I wanted nothing more than get home. The other guys must have thought I was crazy. After throwing all my stuff into the back of my truck, I tore off out of there and never returned. I knew I'd never be able to feel safe knowing that kook was somewhere out in the woods, possibly watching our party. That following Monday, my friend asked what had caused me to leave so abruptly. I made up some lie about my wife being sick. I'm not sure if he even believed it. Nothing was said about it again, and maybe, just maybe, things are better that way. I was 10 years old. My family and I moved houses after my dad got a job offer. I had to leave my old neighborhood, leave along my old friends, and my sister and I had to get used to things all over again. One day we were quite bored, so we decided to take a hike and explore through the new woods around our place. Now, behind our house, that's where the forest is most dense and you could hear a stream running through it. We had been walking about an hour when we heard a snap in the nearby bushes, which freaked out my little sister. She had always been one of those jumpy types of people, but I was stubborn, so we carried on. It was about five minutes after we heard the snap in the bushes, when all around us, nature went silent. It felt like we were being watched, Cliché, I know, but it felt like there wasn't just the two of us. There was something out there staring right at us. 
Then, the forest silence was suddenly broken by a strange yowl, like a screeching cat, but more drawn out and much, much deeper. It was followed by the distressed call from a deer, and then utter silence. The call was about 100 yards away from us, so we bolted. But whatever it was, was gaining on us. And in my panic, I pushed my sister into a thorn bush, and I followed after, too shocked to feel the pain. We held each other tightly, and then we heard a deep growl to the right of us. Slowly, we turned to look, bracing ourselves to come face to face with this beast. But when we looked, there was nothing there. But then the stench hit us, a stench like sulfur, bodily waste, and copper. Then we heard a scratching sound above us, and we snapped our heads up to look at it. What we saw would scar us for the rest of our lives. What we saw was a creature with a body shape similar to that of a panther, but light gray with a black stripe down its spine. The head was more akin to a boar, but its feet, they were like a dog's paws, but it did not have a tail. Its eyes were a misty blue, like it was blind or something. But then it snapped its head to look at us, and I swear, it smiled. It was nothing a human being should ever have to see. It had teeth like razors, and there seemed to be red fluid dripping from its yellowish fangs. We ran, and we did not look back, not even as the branches began snapping, and the growls and grunts of this creature echoed. When we got to the edge of our property, the paw steps faded away. We ran to our front door, opened it, and slammed it shut before passing out from exhaustion and terror on the couch. My sister and I still talk about this incident, and each time we bring it up, the same spark of fear blazes in her eyes. I'll always think of Leah as my first love. It just wasn't meant to be. It didn't seem fair to either one of us. I was going off to college halfway across the country, even at that age, I knew long-distance relationships just didn't work. There may have been a small amount of selfishness involved in my decision, but I assumed Leah would be fine. I put it off as long as I could. With just a week left, I broke the news, and it didn't go well. I spent the entire night trying to convince her that it was for the best, but she never fully seemed to accept it, and things would just get messier from there on. I left that Friday and put that part of my life behind me. Classes kept me busy during the week, but I also worked hard to make friends. Meeting new people isn't hard when you live in the dorms. I was there maybe a month when I met Stacy. She was a sophomore living on the floor above me. We had a lot in common and began dating exclusively, almost immediately. This was also about the time the letters started. It was like she knew that I'd met someone and wanted to destroy it. From then on... A week didn't pass without a letter from Leah. I read them and sometimes wrote back in the beginning, but they all began to sound the same after a point. When I returned home for Christmas, she showed up unannounced. She couldn't understand why I had stopped answering the letters. I had explained it over and over. The relationship was done, and it was past time to move on. I felt like I was speaking to a wall at that point. Not a single word got through to her. And I reached my boiling point. I told her to go away and never bother me again. I left her alone on that porch to cry herself out, and she finally left at around 4am. I felt bad for doing things that way, but I just wanted it all to be over. If it took being cruel, so be it. She'd be better off in the long run, and the remainder of my holiday was quiet. I returned to school with a positive outlook and a renewed vigor, it finally appeared my Leah problem was solved, but instead, she escalated things to an entirely new level. 
Everything came to a head one night in my dorm room. Stacy and I were watching a movie with the lights off. There may have been a little light petting going on. I was occupied when Stacy started yelling. I looked up to see her pointing at the window. Through a small crack in the blinds, I could see a pair of eyes looking in. I grabbed the string and pulled the blinds up. Leah was standing there with a shocked look on her face. I called campus security without saying a word to her. She ran off but was caught trying to get away a few minutes later. I was determined to end it right there and then. I intended to press charges and get a restraining order against her, and I urged Stacy to do the same. And to her credit, she came up with a better and less complex idea. When security asked what I wanted to do, I put it into Leah's hands. I promised I would take no further action if she promised to leave that second and never contact me or Stacy ever again. It was a big risk, but I was willing to take it. I guess there was still that small part of myself that felt guilty for the breakup. She reluctantly agreed, and the officers allowed her to leave. To be honest, I never expected her to keep the agreement. Nonetheless, it's been nine years, and I've received no visits, texts, or phone calls from her. There was one short sympathy letter that she sent upon the death of my grandfather. I was so comforted by that thought that I just let it pass. I can't speak as to whether or not Stacy has heard anything, but I suspect that she's had the same experience. I did return home to work in my dad's company after college and have seen Leah around town on occasion, and we just do our best to avoid each other. I've been told in the intervening years that she is married and began a family, and I wish her all the luck in the world and hope the marriage proves to be a very long and happy one. This is hands down the most horrifying thing that's ever happened to me. I still don't have any answers as to why it happened either, and I probably never will. I had recently graduated college. I was a marketing major, and I was having a hard time finding a job. I didn't have anything lined up for me right after I graduated like some of my peers. So, I did what most people do, and moved back in with my parents. Not gonna lie, it was pretty weird moving back in after having been away for so long. For as long as I can remember, it was just me and my dog. And now I was living with my mom and dad again. It sucked. I normally don't talk about this very much. But when I was younger, I had a natural intuition that that most people don't have. I had some kind of ability to speak to ghosts, or at the very least, to see them. I was that kid that was always was talking to the wall and claimed to be talking to a ghost. I had no idea why I had this ability, but I knew that I did, and remember genuinely feeling a sense and making a connection with it. I always had to make some kind of spiritual or emotional connection with it before I was able to communicate with it. It's really weird to explain, but I can still do it. The ability never went away. It's a little more difficult now, but so I became very interested in it, especially towards the end of my college career. I spent many nights meditating and trying to form connections with spirits around me. So here's the thing. My parents had actually moved when I was in college. I never really felt a strong connection to their new home. Honestly, I didn't really like it, and I had never spent more than a couple of nights there. Even during the summer, I would stay at my apartment in the city only because, well, why not? And again, you can see why it was so weird for me and my dog to move back into my parents' house because I've never really lived in this house. It's not that it was particularly negative or anything, but anyone who is in tune with their mind and body and moves around a lot will remember that it is distressing. Even if there's nothing problematic about it, You can be 100% financially, spiritually, physically secure and fine in every aspect of your life. Moving into a new home will invariably cause some distress. That was one Friday night when my parents had gone out for dinner. They wanted to have a night away from all the regular worries of day-to-day life. I had two other brothers and they're both in high school. So you can understand what my parents who need a break. 
My brother being my brothers both went out to sleep over to friend's house. They only had a year between them, so they hung out in the same friend group. And they all had this weird thing where they would sleep over at each other's houses and just play video games all night. That's left me and my dog, Dory, and home alone. Until my parents got home, at least. And I remember feeling really freaked out. Not in a crazy way or anything, but something just felt off. Like there was something in the air. It was really hard to explain. I remember being in my room reading an article on the best ways to get a job. It was about 9 o'clock at night. My parents probably wouldn't be home until about 11 or 12. I remember being really into this one article. I was taking notes on things that I could do to improve my resume. And then I heard it. My dog needs one really weird noise. It was almost like a bark, but also a whimper. I knew something was wrong because he very rarely made noises. I rushed downstairs to see what was going on. He was sitting there, perfectly fine, as if nothing had happened. And this was extremely unusual. I looked around the house frantically. He had food. He'd just gone to the bathroom, and nothing around the house seemed to be out of place. I chalked up to him not liking being at my parents' house. It sounded rational enough. I made my way back upstairs to get back into the job hunting grind. And then I heard the very same noise again, maybe 15 minutes later. And this time, it really unnerved me. This was very out of behavior for my dog, and I had an odd sense of impending doom. I ran downstairs and looked around for a minute there. I didn't even see my dog. I didn't know where he was. I called out the dory. And, but he didn't answer. Then I made the worst discovery of my entire existence. I realized that my dog was dead. He was just lying on the floor, motionless. It was so weird because he was only about two or three years old. I closely examined his body and didn't appear as if he had even been in a fight or a struggle of some kind. No blood... No bruises, no puncture wounds. It was as if he had just laid down to take a nap and died. I remember feeling really sad. That sense of fear and adrenaline never went away, though. I waited for my parents to get home. I was really psyched out, and I didn't know what else I could even do. I felt like calling the police was a bit too extreme. I didn't want to be the college graduate turned adult who moves back in with their parents for a week and needs them to rush home because he's scared. And this all happened a while back. I still can't explain how my dog died. I ended up landing a job a couple of days later in a nearby city, and I was really happy to have been moved out of that house. It freaked me out pretty bad. And after an incident like that, my parents can visit me any time in the future. In April of 2011, British tourists James Coops Cooper and James Jam Cazares were enjoying a transatlantic vacation in the sunny state of Florida. 25-year-old Coops and 24-year-old Jam had first met at the University of Sheffield in 2005, when both were fresh-faced first-year students. According to friends, they'd struck up an almost instant friendship upon meeting, one which would continue throughout their student years and well into their mid-twenties. The pair had apparently traveled together before, and as anyone who's been on vacation with a close friend before will tell you, if you don't end up murdering the person by the end of the trip, it's evidently a friendship that'll last a lifetime. And that's exactly what kind of friendship Coops and Jam had. Like most of the nights they spent in Florida, Jam and Coops whiled away the midnight hours by drinking beers, munching down the exquisite seafood of Sarasota, and generally being typically British in a place that defines the United States in so many different ways. The night of April 15th was no different, and as the late night ticked over into the early morning, Jam and Coops decided they'd better call it a night. 
They thanked the staff of whatever bar they were in, then proceeded to walk back in the direction of their hotel. But in reality, navigating their way through the dark Sarasota streets proved much easier said than done, and it wasn't long before Jam and Coops were stumbling along alleys and avenues that they didn't recognize. Not that it was a problem for either of them. Witnesses say that they were laughing and joking as they walked, spirits high due to the fine weather and strong alcohol. How could they possibly know that wandering into the Newtown neighborhood of Sarasota would be the single worst mistake of their lives? As Jam and Coops continued to stumble through the muggy Florida night, they heard a voice from behind calling out to them. It was a 16-year-old boy named Sean Tyson, who had apparently heard the two men's accents and had been following out of simple curiosity at first. But Tyson's intentions had quickly shifted from a harmless curiosity to those of an opportunistic predator. He wasn't quite sure where the men were from, but he recognized that they were both very, very drunk. Despite just being 16 years old, Sean was an experienced stick-up artist and often carried a 22 revolver for the explicit purpose of relieving the unwary of their valuables. Some of his neighbors even said he was fond of firing off rounds into the air as a way of both celebrating and intimidating. Upon seeing the young man, it's entirely possible that the drunk and jolly Coop and James would have thought they'd simply made a new friend, a new traveling companion, and someone that could possibly point them in the direction of their motel. But Sean Tyson didn't want any new friends. He wanted their money, and he wasn't shy about letting them know it. At first, the two Brits thought he was asking for money, and they were more than willing to lend him some. They were flat broke from their night of drinking, and they did have a few dollars in change to hand over. But that wasn't enough for Sean. He wanted large bills, he wanted their phones and wallets, and he wanted them handed over fast. It's only then that he produced the handgun, something that let the two friends know that he wasn't messing around. It had the exact reaction he intended it to have. In the UK, it's not straight up impossible to own a firearm, but the government and police make it so expensive and bureaucratically irritating that most people who begin the process give up trying to obtain one. So, generally speaking, when a non-military, non-law enforcement British person sees a firearm, it can provoke a deep reaction of awe, surprise, or even fear. And when Jam and Coop saw the revolver in Sean's hand, any potential fight that might have been in them evaporated entirely. Again, Sean determined that the now terrified friends hand over their cash, but there was a problem. It seems that both men had swapped a large amount of British currency for US dollars at the very start of their trip. This would serve as their budget and ensure they didn't overspend. Any other money in their possession was back in their hotel room, the same hotel they were struggling to find in their drunken state. Jam and Coops must have been absolutely terrified as they tried to explain this to young Sean, offering up their phones and other valuables in substitute. Sean took them without so much as a second thought, but didn't believe for a second that the two were strapped for cash. To them, they were tourists walking dollar signs who were just holding out on him. To the two British tourists, the interaction was surreal in the extreme. They were on holiday, according to their parlance, on break from their dreary lives back in the UK. They weren't wrapped up in the subtleties of US gun laws, nor were they aware of the risk it would incur. All they had to do was show their prospective robber that they had no money. After that, all they had to do was extract themselves from the volatile situation. Walk away. Just walk away. It's what we're told to do when conflict arises. But what do you do when that conflict chooses to follow? Because that's exactly what Sean did on that humid Florida night. He followed Jam and Coops, revolver in hand, demanding they turn over their non-existent cash. We can only imagine how terrified the two of them must have been faced with the kind of threat that would be almost alien to them, a nightmare that had become a tangible reality. The point at which Sean Tyson lost his patience with the men is unclear, but we can be quite clear that he had been following Jam and Coops for quite some time before he finally decided to act. According to his line of thinking, they were lying to him, 
trying to punk him. Tourists were made of money, and the two in front of him just needed proper motivation to hand over their cash. Since you don't have any money, Tyson said, approaching Coops from the rear, I got something for you. Tyson thrust the barrel of the twenty-two revolver into Coop's side and pulled the trigger. The bullet ripped through his liver, kidneys, and intestines, a kind of horrendous penetrative pain that the young Brit had never felt before in his life. Coop's knees buckled almost as soon as the trigger had been pulled, a grunt of pain escaping him as he hit the concrete. For Jam, the terrifying reality of the situation hit him like a ton of bricks. This complete stranger, this young man that seemed no older than a teenager, he just mortally wounded Jam's best friend in the world. All he could think to do was beg for his life, collapsing to his knees beside his wounded friend whilst looking up at their attacker. Please, mate, we're just on holiday, he's believed to have said. We're drunk, we don't have any money, just please don't kill us, please. Tears formed in the young man's eyes as his friend writhed in pain on the concrete. At this point, Sean Tyson must have expected the pair of friends to give up whatever money they had stashed away. Only, they didn't. The unhurt of the two simply begged for his life. Only then did it really occur to Sean that they had been telling the truth the entire time. We can only assume that to an experienced stick-up kid like Sean, this was nothing short of an embarrassment. His instincts had been entirely wrong. He wasn't going to make any worthwhile cash out of it, and what's worse, he had an attempted murder beef coupled with a witness who had seen his face, heard his voice. He even knew which neighborhood police could find him in. There was only one way the encounter could end, and that was with Sean being the only person that walked away from it. And so, with his victim still begging for his life, Sean Tyson raised the revolver aimed it at Jam's head, and pulled the trigger. He emptied his remaining four shots into the chests of each man, finishing them off. Then, soundtracked by a chorus of barking dogs, Sean Taylor picked up the shell casings that were lying on the tarmac, but he wasn't quite done yet. Sean proceeded to pull off the two men's blood-stained t-shirts, as well as pull their trousers down to their knees. It's not clear why he did this, some believe it was a way of humiliating the two Brits in death. Others seem to think it was a last-ditch effort to locate any hidden cash either of the men were in possession of. But what's self-evident is that when the cops finally arrived on scene, the street looked more like the site of an execution than a robbery gone wrong. In the hours following the shooting, Sean gave the shell casings and the murder weapon to a close friend of his, instructing him to bury both in his backyard. However, instead of following the instructions, Jermaine Bain then sold the revolver for $50. This would prove to be their undoing as police traced the gun back to him and also the shell casings. When the cops threatened to charge him with murder, Jermaine rolled on his buddy, telling the cops that Sean had been the one to kill the two British tourists. Sean, who was tried as an adult at Sarasota County Court despite having been just 16 at the time of the murders, was given two life sentences without the eligibility of parole. Before sentence was passed, two of the British pair's friends read out impact statements to the court. For every painful detail of their deaths I have endured, for each disturbing photo I have been exposed to, I'm still glad I have this opportunity to look into your eyes and try to explain the pain that you have caused. Joe Hallett, a friend of the pair's explained, Every night you go to sleep, every morning you wake up, I want you to think of my friends who you murdered. They will haunt you. Back in 2018, a couple of my frat brothers and I were partying down in Panama City over spring break. I was a sophomore at the time and I'd already gotten all my initial spring break excitement out of my way the previous year, so... Myself and my frat bros are mostly just taking it easy. Still partying, sure, but just not nearly as wild or dumb as our first year. Thing is, we can blatantly spot all the freshmen and it was pretty cringe thinking that that was what we looked like just the previous year. Those freshmen became the bane of our lives at some points, 
Showing up and puking right as we're parlaying our way into hanging out with a bunch of hotties, generally making idiots of themselves and causing a bunch of nonsense drama. So at one point, we hook up with these girls from Tennessee who say they're going on a booze cruise and we manage to secure ourselves some invites. It was pretty dope for a while. The music was good. No one was asking for IDs while handing out the beer bottles and after a while, we all started jumping into the water for a swim. Granted, I know that drinking and swimming is a really dumb thing to do, but I'm pretty sure it was only confident swimmers that decided to get in, and besides, the whole drinking and swimming thing wasn't even the danger. Because in the distance, we can see these jet skis approaching, and as they pull up, we can basically tell that these kids are either straight freshmen or just incredibly dumb. They're asking to party with us, but the boat is at capacity, and then they ask for some beers, and they're turned down. They seem to take this on the chin at first, but after a while they start turning nasty, hurling insults, revving their jet skis past us. It gets to the point that they're like swooping past us, getting closer and closer to the people swimming in the water. We're calling out to them, warning them that they're slowly getting near to colliding with one of our swimmers, but I think the engines of the jet skis were just too loud for them to hear. It gets to the point where people are climbing back onto the boat because they just don't feel safe and the captain is talking about calling the cops on these guys because they're obviously drunk and just came out to cause trouble. Then there's literally only one more person in the water, when one of these absolute idiots on the jet skis makes one last pass, super fast and super close to the boat. You heard the impact of his jet skis smashing into the girl when he hit her, like this big, hollow dump noise, and the screaming started. This kid is panicking, and he's revving his engine trying to turn away from the boat he only barely avoided colliding with. Then one of his revs catches something in the water. There's this horrible mechanical crunching sound, and then the water around his back end just starts turning red. People are seriously panicking by this point, but when this poor girl's body floats to the surface, and people see how the propeller blades of that jet ski had made mincemeat out of her head, people straight freaked. If I thought the screams were bad before, these new screams made the others sound like a choir of angels. Even the guys joined in, just absolutely horrified by what they saw. People are running to the other side of the boat to puke. One of the girl's friends is just absolutely inconsolable, wailing like a banshee while the people around her just don't know what to do. About an hour later, the place is just a small fleet of cops on boats and EMTs on boats. I mean, it was real bad. People were just in shock, giving statements to the cops, telling them about the kids on the jet skis who, by that time, were long gone. When we finally got back onto dry land, no one was in the mood to party. We just found a senior that could buy us some beers, then just sat there in one of her hotel rooms, trying to process what we'd just been witness to. One of my brothers said that he's been flirting with her like minutes before everyone decided to jump in the water. About a half hour later, she was dead, and she died in one of the most horrific ways imaginable. We managed one more day down in Panama City before we decided to throw in the towel and drive back to Tuscaloosa. I remember hearing that Tori Lana's song that mentions jet skis in a bar the next day and thinking it was like a sick cosmic joke. And that's when you know you just need to go home. But yeah, be safe on the water, people. It ain't no joke out there. When I was around 15, I lived alone in a two-story house. Although there were bedrooms upstairs, I would sleep on the living room couch. This was for two reasons. One... It was the central location of the house, so I could hear everything, too. It was equidistant from every exit. One night, at around two in the morning, I heard someone juggling the front doorknob. It was slow, cautious jiggle, like they were trying not to be heard. When the door didn't open, they didn't stop. The jiggling slowly became less cautious and more irritated. They persisted for at least two minutes. We went to the back door, which was also locked. If I didn't want to call the police, because I was an unemancipated minor living alone. 
I didn't want to be placed into foster care, and I didn't want my parents in trouble for neglect. Eventually, the jiggling stopped. I stayed up that night waiting for them to try other entrances, but nothing happened. A few nights passed, and I awoke to the sound of the door opening upstairs. The doors in the house would really stick, so they took a lot of force to open. When you popped them loose, they'd make a loud scrape pop and shudder noise. At the time, I would take sleeping pills. It made it really hard to fully awaken, and I'd sometimes only awaken with sleep paralysis. I couldn't determine whether I dreamt the sound or whether I woken up from it. I started to fall back asleep and thought I heard the door close like grinding of wood rubbing together. Then the sound of bed springs screeching like weights were being shifted. I thought, maybe someone is homeless and they thought this was an abandoned house. I was super tired and wasn't sure if I was actually conscious. I fell back asleep and awoke to the feeling of somebody watching me. There were stairs parallel to the living room door, and I could see them from the couch. Halfway down the stairwell, I could see a long-haired man, crouched over, looking at me. It was dark, and I felt like we were both trying to verify what we were seeing. I kept a metal baseball bat by the couch and grabbed it. Slowly, the man erected his body and without turning backed up the stairs. I just listened for him to leave, or waited for him to come back down. But I heard neither. It was like he just stood at the top of the stairs, waiting for me. I didn't go back to sleep. I heard nothing. Even until sunrise. When I left for school that morning, that question what I'd actually experienced... I had my boyfriend over later that evening. As we approached the house, he said, Hey, your windows are open. I looked in the room to the sticking door was wide open. I told him what I'd experienced the night before, and he helped me check out the house. After finding nothing, I enclosed and locked the windows. I figured it must have been a hobo. Once they realized somebody lived there, they left. I still stayed there that night, but I didn't take sleeping pills. I woke to the door opening again. This time, I knew it was real. They knew somebody lived there, but they still returned. At this time of my life, I had little value for my life. I had no fear of death because I knew where I'd go. I decided that I wasn't going to hide in my own house. I got my baseball bat, turned on the lights, and went upstairs. I yelled something like, Listen, buddy, I'm coming up. Be out by the time I get there. I heard nothing and prepared for the worst. I checked the rooms and the closets, but I found nothing, and the windows were still open. I checked the downstairs and found nothing as well. I felt pretty silly after finding nothing, but still stayed out that night. I got ready for school the next morning and saw that the window was open again. It occurred to me that I hadn't checked under the beds when I'd done the search. I didn't have my bat with me and bailed. To think that intruder was possibly hiding under the bed as I searched the house is spooky but I'm partially relieved that I hadn't checked. If I'd been down and come face to face with the man beneath my bed, the story may have ended differently. So I'm a 21-year-old male, and this experience happened last summer while I was on vacation at Myrtle Beach with my family. We were staying in a resort right on the beach, and were on the 13th or 14th floor in a sort of timeshare. One night I was feeling restless and having a hard time falling asleep, and at around 3am, I decided to go out on the balcony to get some air. I stepped out and was stunned as there was a full moon, 
and the moonlight on the water was really beautiful. The beach was completely empty as far as I could see, and I had never seen it like that before. I decided that since I wasn't able to sleep, I might as well head down, take a stroll, and listen to some music to relax. Hopefully when I returned, I'd be able to get some sleep. It was really unsafe and dumb of me, but since it was 3am and the rest of my family was asleep, I decided to just head down without letting any of them know I was going, as I thought I would just go and chill there for about 10-15 to 15 minutes and come right back up. So at the base of the timeshare we were at, there was an area with a pool, an outdoor bar, and then two boardwalks separated by about 100 feet, which both led to the beach. On the sides of the boardwalks, there were swaths of tall grass separating the ocean and the resort. When I got down to the base, the entire area was completely deserted, and I started walking down the boardwalk on the right towards the beach. As I'm walking down, I suddenly see someone approaching me from the beach, which was strange because I had a pretty clear view of the same area from the balcony just before and had literally seen no one. I start to get a bit nervous as I see this figure approach, and as I get closer, I see it as a man, maybe in his late 30s, who has a backpack on and is wearing glasses with large square lenses. As he gets closer, I get a clearer look at him as the boardwalk is sort of illuminated by lights from the outdoor bar. He looks very on edge and alert, almost like he's trying to find someone who's trying to meet him in this area and his clothes are somewhat tattered. We made eye contact and I sort of nod at him and pass. At this point I'm creeped out because honest to god he had a sort of Jeffrey Dahmer look, he was the glasses and he just didn't seem like he actually belonged to the timeshare. I shake it off and keep walking down the beach and put my headphones in. As I get down to the beach, I turn right and start walking parallel to the water, and I'm just taking in the scenery. I'm barefoot and decided to be nice to walk just along the shoreline, so I move closer to the water and continue walking. I'm walking for no longer than a minute before I get a really, really strange feeling that something is wrong. I take off my headphones and turn around and I see a dark figure that is trailing me just up shore. He is situated in between me and the timeshare. I immediately can tell from the figure's height, body type, and demeanor that it is the same man I passed on the boardwalk. At this point I'm starting to panic as every story from Let's Read is rushing to my head. At the same time I'm trying to rationalize as it feels too surreal that I may actually be in a dangerous situation, so I remind myself it could just be a coincidence and the man decided he also wanted to take a walk on the beach and just happened to be headed in the same direction as me. So I take some breaths and turn my head back to the ocean and continue walking in the same direction. After a couple of seconds I turn my head back again and seeing that now, he is much closer to me and is not walking parallel to me but is definitely actually walking towards me. I picked up my walking speed now and turn my head back around and see he is matching my faster pace and is still walking towards me and the water. Still for some reason I think, okay. Maybe he also wants to walk by the water. There's no way I'm actually being followed by a creepy man on a deserted beach. So at this point, to truly test it, I do a 180 and completely change directions. And as I turn my head, I see him completely change directions with me and continue closing in distance. And he's power walking now. It suddenly hits me that I'm in a really bad situation. And I take off in a run along the water and he starts running as well. He stays up shore of me so that if I try to run up towards the boardwalk, he will intercept me. I'm freaking out now and just keep running with no plan, but figured that since I'm 20 and sort of fit, I should probably be able to keep running along the water and outrun him, and then find some other exit off the beach and either call my family or head back to the timeshare on the road. So I keep running, but he's keeping up with me, and this goes on for what feels like 10 to 15 minutes. The scariest part of all of this, which I wouldn't have thought of, is it is completely dead silent. All I hear is my breath and feet on the sand, and when I turn, I only see his shadowy figure up shore keeping pace with me. Suddenly up ahead, in the sand, I see a small blue light and what looks like four people on the beach with a blanket. They are a bit up shore. I turn and look at the figure and bet even though they are up shore, I can beat them to these people, so... I start sprinting towards them with the hopes of quickly telling them what's going on so we all can confront him. I really use up my energy sprinting towards them and as I approach, 
my heart drops. What I see is four guys on a blanket, with three or four handles of hard liquor surrounding them. Three of the handles are empty and the fourth is about half empty. Three of the guys are just completely passed out in the blankets and the last is half sat up, obviously beyond drunk, with a sort of party hat on that has blue lights on it and he's talking to himself. His eyes are half closed and he doesn't even register me approaching him, even though now I'm no more than five feet away. I turn and see the figure has slowed down and is observing me, and then I see he makes sense of the group's state and suddenly starts sprinting at me. As he gets closer, the half-passed-out guy's blue light illuminates him, and I can clearly see it's the same guy as before. I make eye contact with him, and I can see his wide-eyed and looks almost manic and is barreling at me full sprint. At this point, I decided to do something decisive. It seemed like I had underestimated his fitness, and since I had just sprinted towards this group and exhausted myself, I was afraid that he might be able to catch up to me if we just continued running along the beach indefinitely, and then who knows what. So instead of turning around and running, I suddenly sprint towards him and to the right, which I don't think he was expecting at all. I catch him off balance and run past him, and I literally am full sprinting back to the timeshare without even looking back. Literally all the hairs on my neck were standing, and it felt like a dream where you're barely evading someone, but he's right about to catch you. The adrenaline was crazy, and I keep running and start to see the timeshare. I finally turn around to see how close he is, and I see him in the distance, maybe 400 to 500 feet away. He's lost a lot of distance on me. I don't waste any time and sprint up the boardwalk and towards the base of the timeshare. I jam the elevator buttons and leap in and start mashing the closed door button as I'm gasping for air. The door closes and I hit the button for my floor and when the elevator reaches, I literally sprint back to my room, open the door, enter, and then slam the door and double lock it. I'm breathing heavy and I drop to the floor and just sit there for a minute, not believing what just happened. I crouch and crawl over to my room as I was literally afraid he might be able to see through the window on our balcony and I enter my room. Let's just say I definitely wasn't able to sleep after that. In South Korea, national election days are made public holidays so that citizens get a chance to go out and vote. March 26th of 1991 was a holiday for that exact reason. And given that schools are closed on national holidays, a group of young South Korean schoolboys were out making the most of their day off of school. The five boys were from Daozha district of Daegu and attended the same elementary school and although they varied in age from 9 years old to 13, they were all the very best of friends. They were 13-year-old Yu Chao Won, 12-year-old Jo Ho Yun, 11-year-old Kim Yong Yu, 10-year-old Park Chan In, and 9-year-old Kim Jong Sik. On that particular day, the boys decided to spend the day searching for salamander eggs in the streams of Mount Woryong on the western outskirts of Daegu. A sixth child, 10-year-old Kim tae Yong, left the group to go home and eat, having missed breakfast that morning. But the next day, the boy discovered that his parents seemed particularly interested in where he'd last seen his friends. The boy was honest and mentioned that they'd been hunting eggs at a certain section of stream, but the answer didn't seem to satisfy and as much as his parents were trying to protect him from it, it slowly became apparent that something had happened to his friends, something very bad indeed. In fact, none of his five friends had returned home that day and their disappearance sparked a case that would haunt the South Korean national consciousness for years. The story made national headlines, entire news programs were dedicated to sharing information surrounding the boy's disappearance, and South Korean President Ro Tae-woo sent over 300,000 police and military troops to search for the boys. They searched reservoirs, irrigation waterways, bus terminals, and stations nationwide. The fact that the boys were looking for salamander eggs was soon disregarded, as rumor and conjecture replaced salamanders with frogs. Soon the boys were looking for frog eggs, therefore in the national consciousness, they became the Frog Boys. Many of the Frog Boys' parents even quit their jobs to search for their children full-time, with the area they disappeared, Mount Woryong, 
being intensively searched more than 500 times. A series of companies and civic groups made monetary donations totaling 42 million won, or $35,000, as a reward to those who found the boys. But in the years that followed, no one was ever able to lay claim to the reward. With the total lack of evidence or clues regarding the boys' whereabouts, Korean media outlets began to make grim speculations as to the boys' fate. Some journalists at Korea's Jun Ang Daily News made incredibly spurious and irresponsible claims that the boys had been kidnapped by a mentally ill person, despite the fact that there was absolutely nothing to back this claim up. Police would receive hundreds of tips over the years that followed, but none would yield any significant results. The only truly intriguing tip was from a man who claimed to be responsible for the crime. This sick individual claimed to have abducted the children and was keeping them barely alive as prisoners in some unknown location. He chillingly declared that they were alive, but not well. Not much else is known about the fraudulent tipster, but he too was ruled out of the investigation as it became clear that he was only interested in conning the police and the boy's parents out of the 42 million won reward. It took 11 years for any developments in the case, but eventually, in September of 2002, a man searching for acorns in Mount Waryang came across a horrifying sight. In an anonymous phone call to emergency services, the man reported that he'd stumbled across the bodies of five dead and decaying children. When police showed up to close off the crime scene, it was confirmed shortly after that the bodies belonged to those five missing schoolboys that had gone missing all those years ago. At first, investigators speculated that the boys had gotten lost before dying of hypothermia during the night. But the boys' parents completely rejected the idea, claiming their boys knew the area well enough to find their way home under any circumstances. They demanded a full inquiry into their son's deaths with particular focus on why some of the boys' clothes seemed to have been tied into knots. What's more, the boys were just a few minutes' walk from a village they knew well, so to their parents, it was clear that some kind of foul play was at work. Lo and behold, forensic experts later found the skulls of three of the boys had been fractured by blunt force trauma, possibly inflicted by a small metal tool. This led homicide detectives to conclude that they had been murdered by someone who, according to them, had flown into a rage. But what could have the boys done to incur such wrath? Multiple theories have cropped up over the years, some more plausible than others. One of the more likely explanations is that the boys were killed by older bullies who, upon realizing just what they'd done, fled the area and never spoke of it again. There was also a military firing range just a mile or so away from where the bodies were found, suggesting they could have possibly been hit by a stray round. However, given that the day they vanished was a national holiday, it seems unlikely that any kind of formal shooting practice would have taken place that day. Other more terrifying theories include the idea that the boys had been killed by a group of local lepers, who then extracted their livers under the assumption that consuming them would cure or otherwise alleviate the symptoms of their crippling disease. We can speculate all we want, but the fact remains that the cause of death remains a complete mystery, making the case of the murdered frog boys one of the most notorious cold cases in South Korean history. We can only hope that sometime soon, developments in forensic and other investigative technologies reaches a point where we can finally deliver justice to the monster who killed those boys, then covered it up. I'm a 16-year-old female working as a customer care manager of front of house for McDonald's. Now, where I am from, when you are front of the house, you are required to wear a light strip top, a yellow neck scarf, and a pencil skirt just below the knee, which has a small split of the back. I always button my shirt right up to the top, so I always looked very modest, and I would never say a McDonald's uniform is attractive. Anyway, when I worked at McDonald's, I always put my all into everything I did. So I knew tills, drive through drinks, serving, etc. I have also always been someone that will happily have a conversation with someone to make the experience more enjoyable. And hopefully make them want to come back. I was working on tills when the creeper came through the door. 
he was a tall, blonde bodybuilder, at least 50. Though he came to the tilt and order didn't look very happy. So I asked the obvious question, how was your day, etc. He made small talk and we got chatting about both of our dates. After that, he tells me it's nice to see someone smile around here. Everyone else is grumpy. Nice enough compliment. I was used to it. He was right. Not many people here enjoyed this job. He starts coming in once a week on a Wednesday morning. Each morning he would come in, he would have a chat. If I was on the floor front of house, we would sit and chat at a table. And my managers were fine with this, as I knew it made each customer experience unique. We got to know each other's names. His name was Michael. I started college on a Wednesday and Thursday and worked at McDonald's part-time, so my shifts changed. I worked Mondays, Tuesdays, and Saturdays, instead of Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. And sometimes extra days if you need me. Michael started coming in Mondays every day to find when I was working. First red flag. But I figured he's just lonely and needs someone to talk to. Anyway, he worked out my shift pattern and came in on Tuesday instead after asking me why I wasn't on Wednesday because he missed out chats. He'd do this thing where he'd let someone else go in front of him. If it meant that he could come to my till instead, he would wait to one side to get served by me. Odd, but I didn't think too much of it. Just thought he was a man that likes to be served by someone with a smile and had taken a liking to me. Again, we chatted when he came in. And this is where it got a bit more weird. We were sat down talking, and he decided to really open up to me. He told me how him and his wife were going through a messy divorce. He started going into the detail of why he had to punch his son. Now this guy was big, like he looked like a bodybuilder. I can't remember exactly what had happened, but he had ended up smacking his wife too, I think. And here he was telling me about it. I'm no counselor after all, after proceeding to tell me how big his house was. Probably to try to grip my attention. He started telling me how he was living in the basement of the house that he owned, and it wasn't fair. I'm going to hit her again if this carries on. Apparently the wife and son wanted him out, and they were going to have it and not pay him for blah blah blah. He wasn't letting that happen. His son went talk to him blah blah blah. He started asking me for advice. A 16 year old girl. I don't really know what to say, so I just sort of said, everything happens for a reason I suppose. And as I went to get up, he asked me to sit back down. Now I had already been sat down for nearly half an hour, and I know that I said my managers don't mind, but that's pushing it a little bit. So I told him I really had to go. He carried on trying to get me to stick back down, but let me go in the end. Now, this may seem totally unrelated, but trust me, it'll make sense later on. In McDonald's, you have the source pumps, right? Well, they're connected to a big bag of sauce which has a pop-up in the front of it. You basically pop the tube into the popper on the bag, but this thing is fiddly. It can take me about 10 minutes just to get it connected. Then to put the new bag in and hold on the side is another 5 minutes. It's a nightmare. Right back to the story. The sauce had run out, and I had to fiddle about getting it where the sauce dispenser is right opposite from where Michael always sits. I could feel eyes burning into the back as I did this, and any time I turn around, he would be looking at me and just smile. It made me feel a fair bit uncomfortable. But hey, it's my job. And you deal with this stuff all the time. Trust me, he's not the first person. I've had perving on my bomb. He came back a few more times, and each time I felt more and more uneasy. He started being a bit more personal, telling me he thought I was a pretty young girl, and we should meet up for coffee at some point and I politely declined. Michael then said, Can I ask you something personal? 
Depends what it is. I can't promise I'll answer. Are you a virgin? I'm not answering that. What size are your boobs? I have a boyfriend and I'm not comfy answering these questions. Do you love your boyfriend? Would you leave your boyfriend for me? My boyfriend's behind the counter. I don't think he would be very happy with you asking me questions like that. Just make sure he treats you right. You are a lovely girl. Anyway, I won't be coming back here for a while, so can I have your number? I don't think my boyfriend would be happy with that either. After that, I go to the back room to calm myself as this was very unnerving for me. He was an older guy being very strange and asking super inappropriate questions of me. He knew my age, as I had told him previously. The day continues. He had left. I finished and went on. When I woke up the next morning, I had a message on WhatsApp, a message on Facebook and a friend request on there, and an Instagram follow. It was Michael. I don't know how, but he had found all my personal accounts just through my first name. The only way I can think of him finding out is by asking a colleague what my surname is and getting my number off one of them. Maybe he was friendly with one of the other workers and got my number from them. I don't know. He had messaged me, saying how he needed to see more of my pictures. My Facebook and insert set the private. But he saw the main pictures of them and my WhatsApp photo. He had sent another message about how he loved looking at my ass when I was bent over crawling on the floor to fix the sauce bags. I don't know if the split in my skirt was revealing, but I don't think it was saying all these things he would love to do to me. At that point, I knocked out and blocked him on everything. I still get messages, not sexual though, from other accounts he has made. Wishing me a Merry Christmas, etc. Even though he should have gotten the gist of me not wanting to talk to him. Luckily for me, I moved away a week or so after that happened. So Michael, let's not meet again. This story takes place two years ago, when I was living in the same house as my two younger sisters and my father. We lived in a neighborhood that wasn't necessarily unsafe, but wasn't the best neighborhood for people to live in. I can recall some neighbors getting arrested for dealing when I was maybe five, but the story isn't about them. In the summer of 2018, my sisters and I would stay up late into the night, sometimes only going to bed after the sun had risen. I was 17 and my sisters were 15 and 13. My father would go to bed early, as he was a responsible adult. To explain the situation best, I need to describe what my house looked like. It was a one-story home with four doors on the front of my house, three of which opened to our living room, and one of which opened to my bedroom. Our backyard fence had been knocked down by a storm recently, and we had two doors on the back of the house, one that opened to the kitchen, and one that opened to my father's room. One night at around 12.30am, I was doing what I usually did. I was listening to scary stories on my phone as I made art on my iPad. I didn't use earbuds because I've always been paranoid that something might happen while I'm using them. My sisters, who shared a room down the hall from me, were doing whatever they did at night. It didn't really concern me. My father was fast asleep in his room. Now, I don't know about all of you, but I always end up very on edge when I'm listening to scary stories, so I'm hyper aware of what's going on around me. You can imagine how hard I jumped when I heard a sharp pounding on our front door. Four hard thuds could be heard throughout the house, and I could hear the front door shake with the strength of each knock. I checked the time, terrified. It was 1am. I held my breath, hoping to God that I'd heard wrong. I really didn't want to think someone was at my front door. At this moment, my middle sister Jen came running to my room trying to keep her step silent. She looked at me, eyes wild. You heard that too, right? She asked, voice trembling. I swallowed and nodded, heart pounding in my chest. We need to go wake Dad up. I responded and started towards my father's bedroom. Julia followed diligently behind me. 
On her way to our dad's room, my youngest sister, Ness, peeked her head out from her room. She too looked scared. I opened my dad's door and shook him awake, trembling slightly. One of my worst fears is someone breaking into our house. Dad, someone's at the front door. Even as I said this, I felt sick. What? Dad whispered, groggy and not at all happy that we had woken him. There's someone here, Jen whispered. I heard it. Someone knocked on the door. I nodded all too eagerly. My dad slowly got out of bed. He knew that my sisters and I always jumped to the worst conclusions whenever anything happened, so he assumed we were doing the same here. I watched silently as he went to the front door, my stomach leaping to my throat. There's no one out there, he told my sisters and I, absolutely unimpressed as he looked through the blinds. My heart sank a little. I kind of started to doubt myself, but my sisters had heard the knocking too, so I knew I wasn't alone in this. I tried to reason with him before he went back to bed, but he didn't believe us, too scared to really care what we were saying. Dejected but scared, I ended up taking my mattress off my bed and sleeping in my sister's room for the night, taking a baseball bat and lying it next to my mattress. My overactive imagination had me thinking that whoever was at the door was out to kill us, and I knew I have to defend my younger sisters against any danger that dared enter our house. The next day passed just fine. My sisters and I knew we had heard something and our dad brushed off our attempts to explain it. He thought we were sleep deprived or perhaps that a large bug had hit our door. That explanation I had frowned at. It wasn't until 11pm that night when my father was lounging on one of the couches in the living room that we heard the pounding again. Only this time it was much more aggressive and directly on the door behind my father. My father let out a loud, frustrated scream and charged toward the front door. I had been standing in the living room when the pounding occurred again and my sisters had rushed to stand next to me after hearing my father shout. We were all shaken. Our father never yelled like that. I started to cry as my father went to rush outside and confront whoever was out there. I begged him not to go outside in case he were to get hurt. He told my sisters and I to call the cops and he cursed some more when he realized that whoever had knocked on the door was now gone. My sisters called the cops and they arrived fairly quickly, talking with my dad about what was going on, claiming that there had been other complaints about this happening and explaining that they would try their best to find out who was doing this. The police did a search around her house but didn't find anyone, even searching the backyard where I was afraid the perpetrator might be. The police assured us that someone would patrol the neighborhood that night. Once the cops were gone, my dad apologized for not believing us the night before. We said it was okay and left it at that. He locked all of the doors and stayed up later than my sisters and I. I couldn't calm down, so I slept in my sister's room that night as well. Eventually though, I put this situation behind me. A few months had passed, but not without nightmares and sleep paralysis about the whole ordeal. Most nightmares ended with someone breaking in and hurting my sisters. Other nightmares ended in more brutal ways. I thought nothing more of the whole ordeal. This is until one day I came home from school and Ness ran up to me, buzzing with energy. She proceeded to tell me that apparently the cops had found out who was knocking on everyone's door about a month or so ago. It was some older guy who lived a few houses down from us. They had gotten him to stop and I'm not sure if he was given a warning or something. He was a little unstable mentally and nobody had ever opened their doors for him. Ness then told me that the same guy had been arrested earlier this day. I was shocked. He'd only been knocking on people's doors at odd hours of the night. I asked her why he'd been arrested. He shot and killed 15 people one town over. She responded, I couldn't believe it, but my father later confirmed this story. I'm happy to say that he is in jail and no longer lives in that neighborhood. I haven't done any more looking into his crime other than trying to confirm it for myself the day he was arrested. I'm also happy to say that after another recent event where someone tried to break into our house, my father installed a ring doorbell, the doorbell with the camera, which gave my sisters and I some comfort. 
I hope this man gets what he deserves, or maybe that he gets the help he needs if he really truly is completely insane. I also hope that the families affected by this man's actions are able to find some form of closure in knowing that he's locked away for what he's done. I was 19 years old at the time. I had a really good opportunity to go to college, but things fell through a couple of months into it, and basically, I wasn't allowed to go back at that college. I'm not going to go into the details, but I found myself stuck. I was living at home with my parents and working at McDonald's most of the time. I was really disappointed in myself, especially because I didn't have anyone else to blame but myself. I seemed to be your typical college dropout that ended up working at fast food. But while I was working there, I had a couple of really strange experiences. So the first one happened like this. There was this really creepy customer. He was an old man, and he just seemed like the most insane individual ever. You just have to think of the physical embodiment of Florida Man. He always wore this bathroom robe with a stained white t-shirt underneath. Or shoes. He had these really old Nikes that seemed like they had been completely covered in mud and never washed. Everywhere he stepped, there was some residue coming off of his shoes. I don't know how far he lived, but this guy came in to eat at McDonald's four or five times a day for as long as I worked there. I never personally had any horrible experiences with him. It wasn't like he was this unruly customer. He always asked for extra ketchup, but it's not like that was a crime or anything. The story is weird because I remember talking about him with some of my co-workers I had one friend there that I had became rather close with. I remember talking with her about this creepy guy that had just came in to eat McDonald's all the time wearing his pajamas. When you work with the public, there are so many people and faces that you see all the time, and none of them mean anything, it's just another customer. But when you have someone like this, it almost makes the job a little bit more bearable, as weird as that might sound, a little bit more consistency to the job. Plus, making jokes about someone like that was kind of fun. But there was one day when the jokes weren't funny anymore, because he stopped coming in. They couldn't find out why either. I mean, when you see someone multiple times a day, every day for months on end, you get a little surprised when they stop showing up. It all just seemed, I don't know, unusual. I remember talking to my friend about it. Neither of us could imagine why he stopped. I remember getting a phone call at 2 in the morning that night, though. I guess my friend had gotten curious and looked around online. She's a bit of an insomniac. I guess he had been arrested on multiple drug charges. She had found a picture of him in the public database for our county's police department. In the mugshot, he was wearing that exact same bathrobe that we always saw him wearing. That was interesting. Really weird to think that someone I saw and interacted with multiple times a day was an actual dealer. But I guess that was that. My other experience working at McDonald's was really bad. Not going to lie to you. It really freaks me out and really made me question humanity. So it happened like this, right? I was working the graveyard shift. It must have been around 12am and we didn't have any customers. We already cleaned all the machines as much as we could and there really wasn't anything to do. We lived in a smaller community, so there weren't too many people coming in to eat at such a late hour. We had a few here and there, but we were mostly just sitting around, particularly slow this night. I remember going over to check the garbage cans for the other side of the store. Occasionally, we would forget to empty that garbage pail. It was directly behind a booth and out of sight from the area we normally worked in. I remember going over there and... There were two big bags of garbage that needed to be taken out. They were too heavy to take out at the same time, so I did what any sane person would do. I carried one out at a time. I remember bringing the first one. I threw it into the dumpster and I remember hurting my back a little when I did it. I went for a little bit of a theatrical throw and really felt it there. I went back into the store to get the second bag of garbage and I made my way outside. I got about 10 feet away from the dumpster when I saw something that shocked me. I dropped the bag of garbage. I couldn't believe my eyes. There was a mutilated puppy. Its entire snout had been cut off. 
I wasn't sure if it was alive or not. It wasn't moving or anything. I took a step closer to try to see a little bit more and I just felt my heart drop into my stomach. It was the most horrifying thing I'd ever seen in person. It was definitely dead. It wasn't leaning up against the dumpster and it was just a horrifying thing to see. I ran back inside and asked my coworkers what we should do. We decided to call the police but they didn't really help much. We were really freaked out at who could have possibly done this and why they would put the puppy there of all places. The part that still freaks me out is that whoever had done this had been waiting for me to go back inside of the building and in the few seconds before I came back out, put it right next to the dumpster. I figured they must have been watching me. Didn't know what else to think about it though. Our McDonald's didn't have an outside camera other than the drive through so... There was no hope of trying to identify the person that did this, but it still makes me sick to my stomach to think what that person could be like.